First time in a while to movie battleground that's right this is not a dream i am on your computer screen again which can only mean one thing three hour videos <laughs> um <laughs> that intro lasted long uh no my name is aaron canal guys first off uh this is the first video we are posting on the worldwide movie games network channel so i just wanted to say that i'm excited to be a part of this and have the future videos appear on this channel but uh, we're starting with a big one. So if you guys uh, followed us at any point through last year, you guys know that we had matches going all the way from end of July up until mid-December, uh, at which point we just stopped caring. And uh, we had the top-ranked competitors appear in a title fight. So at the end of December, it was officially confirmed. Linus Babcock, Luca Fallon, and Jeremy uh, Adams would be appearing in the title fight. The 10 years that it took between that unofficial announcement and the recording of this video, unfortunately, Luca had some personal stuff come up and he had to drop out of the fight. In the future, he will get his chance to go for the title again. We're definitely going to make sure of that. But in the meantime, the next ranked player stepped up and appeared in today's match. And we're super excited to be here playing this match and getting our first official movie Battleground champion. On that note, we're going to go ahead and introduce the players. We'll start with the uh latest addition to this match with a record of two defeat or two wins and one defeat how you doing hey i'm doing okay i just like to point out the irony that the guy who beat me by a very slim margin of three to four has at least dropped out so you literally have the next best player in line so there's that whatever makes you feel better about yourself bro <laughs> up next after um, Coming in with a record of two to two wins, one defeat, one knockout, and one three-way knockout. Linus Babcock, how you doing? I'm good. Very excited to be here. These games are always fun. Not sure how this is going to go. We have great competitors here, and it's going to be exciting, and this is going to be a great fight. All right, and the man that proves that I am not biased to the admins, coming in with a 3-0 record, Jeremy Adams. Jeremy, how you doing? I'm doing great. I just wanted to start off by making a terrible joke. I thought I was going to play in a championship today, and instead I ended up babysitting. <laughs> but seriously, you know. I'm really excited to be here. I respect all you guys. It's been an amazing season. It's been an honor to be a part of it, and I'm just thrilled that I could be here today. Uh, I just want to say I am legal. You're not babysitting me. I am legal. <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't know if I was the last I, time. I, I no, I'm kidding. Be your dad, though. <laughs> That's fair enough. But I'm using that against you, by the way. Let's do this, guys. Let's get into this fight. So, uh, this title match is going to work in the tri in the triple threat format. However, because it is a title match, we've extended this out. So today we have eight questions that these are guys are going to go back and forth on. Now, just to preface this ahead of time, um, because he was a last minute addition to the fight chose to opt out of three questions on this match and he instead put his research and focus into five out of the eight questions so the questions that include all three fighters are going to have an opening statement and a closing statement with six minutes to fight the match rounds with only two players are going to have five minutes to fight with this match we're also implementing a new rule in past matches the first or second first and second rounds depending on how long the match would be were given an extended run time limit uh, instead, what we're doing from, and if it works today, we'll do this from here on out, is every player is going to get one match time, ex or round time extension. Each player at the beginning of the round can say whether or not they want to extend their time if they believe that they can defend their argument to the best of its abilities further, or if they believe they can hit down the opponent's choices with, a, with more time. Each player, will, like I said, will get one that they can use the match by one of the players on a round with three players included then the time limit will go up from six to eight and if it's used on a round with only two players it'll go from five minutes to six minutes uh, the players are not required to use this at any time activate it before we start the opening statements of the round they cannot wait till any point in the round to activate it, it has to be said before the round starts in order for us to use it End of the main game, we will have two players moving on to a maximum of five question speed round, so someone is mathematically the victor, will be out. 
Now, just so you guys know, these three players have obviously done well enough to prove themselves to be here. So just because they are, I mean, they won't have a shot at getting the title again. Obviously, they, the two losers, do have seeds in the upcoming tournament that we have. And we also have the five-way title contention match at the end of the tournament. And the two players who lose today, no matter whether they finish in the tournament, will automatically have seats in that turn in that match. Questions, guys? I'm good. We're good to go. Ready? All right. Love the energy, guys. Hmm. We're, we're going to move on to the first question of the day. So, comic book movies kind of a big deal in our world um we have multiple of them every single year at this point they're even getting academy award nominations which is like unheard of unless you died first that was in bad taste rest in peace Heath Ledger um sometimes they're not always perfect sometimes it's as simple as changing one or two little things about a movie in order to make it right and sometimes so we decided to ask this question. Which villain in a comic book movie would work better in a different comic book movie? And the example given was the information that was later released that Steppenwolf was originally meant to be used in Suicide Squad instead of being used in Justice League. So here's the idea behind the question. So the competitor had to pick a comic book character from a movie and transplant that exact character into another comic book movie, and their argument's going to center around why this would improve the movie they're moving it into. All right, so the rules are clear for everybody. Are we ready to go? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So with that, we are going to have the opening arguments first, guys. Uh, just be aware. Um, try to keep the opening arguments as concise as we possibly can, along with the closings, just to kind of keep this match moving. We're going to start this first round. Uh, go ahead. Uh, which villain in a comic book movie would work better in a different comic book movie? Okay. So as Aaron said in, in his opening, it's we're not changing a whole movie here. We're just making a tweak that's going to improve the movie. So I have chosen for my movie one of my very favorite comic book movies that is nearly perfect, Captain America Civil War. Great movie. But there was one huge missed opportunity with this movie, and that is indeed the villain, which is, which is the issue here. I believe they, they took a villain from the comics, Baron Zemo, totally changed him, got a nondescript dude who had a little bit of a personal crisis with the Avengers, and he is the guy setting everything in motion, and it's a guy that we don't really know much about, we don't really care much about, he doesn't really play in anything in the larger story, and I just felt like that whole part of this great movie was lacking. So I came up with a solution that ties into uh, comic book movies in, in general and also ties into the, the story from the comics. So my solution is to take a great actor, Willem Dafoe, who played Norman Osborn slash Green Goblin in the original Spider-Man movie with Tobey Maguire. Uh, I felt that he was a little bit lacking in that movie. He wasn't given great material. The script was a little lacking and it was hammy. But he's a great actor. We've seen him this year in The Florida Project, which he's Oscar nominated for. He was awesome in Murder on the Orient Express. He's a great actor. And I think he could be one of the all-time great comic book villains given better material. So my idea is have him play Norman Osborn, this, this great billionaire who uh, is there. He's a rival to Tony Stark, as he was in the comics. And he's the one who's secretly working behind the scenes to tear the Avengers apart from, the, from outside, setting little seeds, setting Winter Soldier against uh, Iron Man with the whole thing. Spoilers with uh, how Tony's parents were murdered. He's the one working behind the scenes. He's the one who pretends to be a scientist and has a cool accent to, to throw them off, to, to trigger the Winter Soldier. And at the end of it, they still don't know it's him. He's done it all. He's won, and he's still out there. And ultimately, the storyline is, is set up for him to set up the Dark Avengers to take over to actually have his own Avengers team and be the one that can be working that, to driving the Avengers into secret, which is what we saw after the Civil War storyline in the comics. So we, we have all this promise from the comics that we set up. We don't take any screen time away. Like, the screen time will be the same. He's just the villain. He's in the same amount of scenes. And the overall story is enhanced. Everything is made better. And you've set up a lot more. You haven't wasted an opportunity with just another bland villain. All right, Linus, you are up next. 
All right. It was shown Jeremy had great knowledge with that pitch. So that was very good for you. And um, my pitch is going to be two things that had great potential that I feel could have had great potential. And if you put them together, maybe even ha- would have had amazing potential. And the first one didn't turn out great at all. And that is Jim Carrey as Edward Nigma, the Riddler in Batman Forever, which was terribly executed. But, you know, Jim Carrey is an amazing actor with his dramatic roles and his comedic roles. So he could play a psychotic, crazy man with mysteries and detective things. And I would put him into Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight Rises, which overall I think is a good movie, but I think has some serious issues. And you could have put Edward Nigma into multiple areas of that film to improve it. Just because that was a character that was rumored to be in that film. That was a character everyone wanted to be in that film. But having the characters like Tatia Al Ghul and Catwoman be a hero, a lot of them were more underused. So having a stronger villain that people would latch onto, like the Riddler, could have made a stronger send off for the Dark Knight franchise. Okay, and Evan, you're up next. All right, so here's what here's what happens. Um, Avengers 2 is probably one of the most underwhelming um, comic book movies to come out. It did great at the box office, but especially as time has uh, progressed and time moves on, people have looked down on Avengers 2 because it just doesn't have that flair that it's needed. It, you could, and you could argue it's due to the villain of Ultron not being well executed because maybe he just can't be done on screen. You had the family ties with Tony Stark and, and, um, and the fact that he made Ultron and that was his son slash baby, you know, however you want to call it. Um, but what was good about the first Avengers was you had that great villain. And also, at the end of the Avengers, you got teased a great villain in Thanos. Now, Thanos is that villain that I think you need in Avengers 2. You built him up in the first Avengers. You built him up in, uh, in the first Guardians of the Galaxy. You drop him in at Avengers 2. Even from a box office standpoint, you're no longer milking this out. You're putting it out there, and you don't have a bad villain for Avengers 2. I truly do think if you pull this movie and you turn it all off, Josh Brolin's Thanos would have been much better because you finally would have had something galactic just looking down on the Avengers. And I think it would have made for a better arc in Avengers 3 where you now really have them trying to rebuild themselves up and going to defeat a greater foe. So that's my mini little pitch. And with that, guys, we're going to go to the open. You guys are going to have six minutes to argue this one out. We can speak. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quickly go against you guys real quick. Just my, my quick hits here. Uh, for Linus, the, the one thing that works in your movie, The Dark Knight Rises, is the villain. Bane is, by everyone's estimation, the best part of that movie. So if you're you going to take Bane in out of the movie, you're inherently possibly going to hurt that movie really bad because it's the one thing that really works and if you're just adding him in then you're just you're taking away from Bane and you're cluttering an, an already cluttered movie and plus Jim Carrey uh, I, I don't know that he, he I really don't think he would work the way that an actor like Tom Hardy would in that Nolan verse uh, he, he's tried playing dark and brooding um, uh, before and it's never really worked out very well for him so I just don't think that would fit and you're taking away from your great villain for Evan Thanos is Infinity War. That's what we're building for is this great intergalactic story with Infinity War. And Ultron went along with Civil War and setting that up. So if you put him in too early, you're changing everything. It doesn't work. It doesn't fall together. I could see taking Ultron out and putting someone else in. But to put Thanos in there early, you're shooting your load. We, we got to set up. We got to set up Vision so that he gets the Mind Stone that Thanos can eventually dig. We got to set all of this up. You're putting him in early and you're just it, it doesn't work. Then we don't build the Infinity War. Okay, uh, I just want to knock Linus out really fast. Jim Carrey, you could argue, is the worst part of Batman Forever. So you're going to put in the mm-hmm. worst part of a movie into into The Dark Knight Rises, which the villain is the best part of the movie. Your claim just makes zero oh. sense. I feel so bad for you. Now i got to beat Jeremy. <laughs> okay, so here's the issue. Look, Zemo was there because you want the story to focus around Civil War themselves. And I know you said, you know, same screen time, whatever, but the second you put Willem Dafoe as the Green Goblin in there, you're just going to chew up the spotlight on the true issue, which is a problem, especially in Civil War. Um, and then you also, you, you, you blame the script a little bit for, for Willem Dafoe's performance, but when you break it down, Sam Raimi gave one of the best superhero scripts ever in Spider-Man 2, and I would argue the script for the first Spider-Man was equal to that, and 
you don't blame the script there. You blame the performance. Um, so there's that. And then also, it changes the story. Whether you like it or not, it changes the consequences. It, it, it changes it changes the whole general concept of things. And that's why you can't do that. Because if you go to the Dark Avengers, then you can't really set up for Infinity War. And that's a big uh, deal there. So I like... They did both in the comics, but... Okay. but but this is, I think that's the problem with both your choices. It's going to mess up the universe. Surplus of comics. See, mm-hmm. with my movie, it's the finale of a trilogy. Changing the villain, who I would think you would change Marion Cotillard's character more so than Tom Hardy, and he can be still sort of the assistant, and the Riddler's more the mastermind like it was in the actual movie with Marion Cotillard's character. But with both your films, if you change the villain, like having Green Goblin in Civil War... It makes him too similar to Tony Stark, in my opinion. And the whole point of Baron Zemo is he was affected by the aftermaths of Civil War, uh, I mean, of Avengers 2. And he is against all that. And yeah, it's a more personal story. I don't think if you put, if you put Green Goblin in there, I don't think it would work as well because we all know him as this Norman Osborn, the greedy business type. And that's what Tony Stark is pictured to be in that film. So I don't see how that would work at all. You would have two Tony Starks. Also, fanboys. If you put... Green Goblin in at the same amount of screen time that Baron Zemo had. I'm very mad for wasting the character like that. It's very true. Okay. Okay. All right. To first to respond to Evan with the idea of Willem Dafoe. Okay, Willem Dafoe is in Spider Man too, the so called great Spider Man, the Sam Raimi movie as a cameo, scene, and he's very he's very good in that scene. It's a cameo. Uh, the material was, scene. wasn't there in the first movie, and this is not going to be the same kind of character. He's going to be playing a different kind of material than he was playing in the Sam Raimi, which was all big and oh, he's got uh, issues with his son, and it's all and he's mad and he's angry and he's and he's raging out all the time. This is different. This is a methodical guy, and we don't really need to respond to Linus. We don't really need what we had uh, with the the emotional storyline with, you know, he's reacting to what happened with the Avengers because we already have that. We have characters that we see, like Tony has to contend with his own guilt over everything that he's done. Why would Goblin want to do that? We don't need the villain to represent that. The villain is taking all of that and using it against them. And and it's not going to take away from anything because we're just introducing him. We're introducing, this is also the movie in which we introduce Spider-Man. So you get Spider-Man in there and you're also introducing his ultimate nemesis, but they don't really know each other yet it's setting everything up it's a lot of easter eggs it's a lot of setup and he's yes, a lot of expectations because the right too, too many problem. characters yeah too many characters too many expectations which has been a problem there's a reason with our fanboy community there's a reason they use baron zemo because he's a lesser known smaller character he's not supposed to be the focus of the film the focus of this film is supposed to be he, captain america versus iron man putting green goblin he, in i think distracts from that I agree. It doesn't distract it. He is not the focus of the film. He is there at setting things up, working against the scenes and being awesome in the scenes that he has. He does not detract. And he also is going to set things up. And, and the Dark Defenders thing does can coalesce with the Age of Ultron storyline. It still can work. It's still something you can set up to. And, and even if you don't set up to it, you have the promise there. You're not just wasting a character that no one cares about. Well, also, I think that's, with- the, that's the issue, I think. The second you put in Norman Osborn, whether you like it or not, less screen time or not, it's going to detract away from the story because it is Norman Osborn. Remember, Spider-Man is probably, you, you could argue, the most famous um, Marvel property that they have. I don't think you can debate that. Um, so you put in the number one villain against Spider-Man in there, they're going to take away from their story. And let me just argue for Thanos really fast. You've got to put things in perspective. In order to complete your full arc, you really need Thanos in that second movie just to destroy the Avengers, wreck them down. You've, you've teased him twice. You can't milk, milk it out too much. I actually think Infinity War is going to way underperform because this the character has been milked out too much. You put him in in Avengers 2, it's the perfect time to do it. It's been teased enough, and you're finally going to get a story where the Avengers are defeated, and that's what you need. Okay. That is, and exactly that's what we're that's what we're building to. You're shooting. Fire. They're, they're fire. not ready to fight him. Too early, we can't the build to that in the in Infinity War. Time. All right, all right, guys. Good first round. Um, we're gonna go into closing arguments. Jeremy, you're up first. Go ahead. All right, so. To kind of respond to what's been said before, Norman Osborn, he, he is, we're meeting this character really for the first time. 
Um, yeah, some comic book fans may have some baggage with the character. They may know ultimately where he goes, but it's still a blank slate. It's a fact. To, it's a chance to set up a new character with a brilliant actor to give him great material and to have him. And he will have, you know, an emotional arc. He does have issues with Tony. Tony and him have baggage in the past. He has issues, you know, with with the Avengers at large. He is a character who who you know. I think in this conception of the character will be, will be somebody that does have sympathy to him because he thinks he knows how the world should run. He's not just this evil mustache twirling bad guy who just wants to screw everything up. No, he thinks he, he, he's kind of got a little bit of a Donald Trump thing. Sorry to get political, but he <laughs> thinks he knows how things should run. He thinks, I mean, Tony did a terrible thing with creating Ultron in the last movie. Um, and you know, everyone's reacting to that. So he's, He's got a message, he's got a motive, and he wants to do the right thing. And we see the little seeds of insanity with him. We see like his, some of his tech like in the background, so we get a little bit of a flash. Oh, this guy's going to probably go bad eventually. We see maybe a scene where he sees Spider-Man on a TV, and you get that little Easter egg moment that would be an awesome thing. Oh, those two are going to clash eventually. There's all those awesome little moments. But at the same time, this is a character who he's going to get his hands dirty. He's going to do some questionable things, but he thinks he's doing it for the right motives. And again, I will remind you, Willem Dafoe is a great actor, one of the all-time great actors. Watch him in Platoon. Watch him in Born on the Fourth of July. Watch him in The Florida Project this year, which if there was any justice, he would win the Oscar for that. He's a brilliant actor. He was given hammy stuff of Jeff James Franco. He was in the Green Goblin outfit being weird. He's not going to be in the Green Goblin outfit in this. He's going to be Norman Osborn. That's something we'll build to eventually. And this is going to be an awesome kick-ass villain and Zemo he was a one-off he didn't really matter no one really cared and it it was a missed opportunity for building the relationships of all these great characters all right Linus you're up next for closing go ahead all right with my film it is the third act the final act of a trilogy it's not going to mess anything up it's not going to destroy a universe or completely destroy characters and I think you would put the Riddler into the Marion Cotillard role as the guy who kind of tricks Wayne and we can have the riddles and Christopher Nolan is shown to be great with mysteries with memento and I think Jim Carrey could play that role maybe not he would be more dramatic I don't think it has to be brooding per se but I think he'd do it fantastically with the Green Goblin in Civil War I don't think it works like we said before he's too big of a character and it would change the film drastically because the role Baron Zemo plays is supposed to be a smaller role it's supposed to not be important and it's supposed not to not really take away from it and I don't really want to see a new version of Green Goblin introduced in Civil War because we have Spider-Man introduced in Civil War. We have Black Panther introduced in Civil War. We have all these huge things introduced in Civil War. Interviews introducing Spider-Man's biggest villain I don't think belongs there. With Avengers Age of Ultron, I think that's a fine movie. It's not great. It's not perfect. But it does what it needs to do to continue the universe along. If you put Thanos in that early, you wouldn't have the development with the characters. They would be destroyed, and I don't think that's what most audiences want to see. We wouldn't have the big finale that everyone was waiting for. We wouldn't have the huge final chapter that everyone wanted to see. We wouldn't have characters like Ant-Man in there. We wouldn't have characters like Doctor Strange or Guardians of the Galaxy in there. None of that would be in there and wouldn't be the finale most people wanted to see. It would be more underwhelming than what Infinity War is going to be if they rushed it like that and put him in there. Ultron was good for what it needed to do and it set up the universe like it had to. All right, and Evan, go ahead. Something I want to hit on is the fact that both of your movies, whenever you either add in or take out a villain, it's not the central part of their movie. Um, you said you want to add the Riddler, but it won't take away from Bane, but that's the issue. These movies need a sense around their main conflict, and whenever you add in a, a very high-profile character, such as um, uh, the Riddler, it's going to take away from that. And I think whenever you you put that in perspective, you don't want to take away from Bane, Tom Hardy's performance, and how massive he was, because then you just have this guy in a green outfit just kind of going to ruin the movie. Um, and then the bank on to um, Willem Dafoe and uh, Green Goblin. What works about Civil War so much was the conflict wasn't the villain. And everything that you described to us as in what you wanted to do, you said moments. Zemo barely had a moment. And that's what I thought made him effective, for his role at least. You can't, you're going to make it a three hour movie because you need to develop this first time character that you're seeing. Him going crazy, him being smart, him being methodical. That's just too much development in order to not take away from the story, which I think is important. And then, um, Linus, you also said about Thanos, you know, you need time to develop, but that could be part of the rebuild is once they're destroyed, they're out searching 
for more people to fight with so they can actually beat this big, massive destruction of things. That's why you Thanos in the second movie. And he can still be in the third movie, too. That's the beautiful part of it is, okay, we got destroyed Avengers 2. Let's build him up for Avengers 3. Thank you. All right, and with that, that is the first round of this fight down. The one thing I that stood out to me that I wanted to fact check real quick was um, there was a statement made in the fight uh, talking about the script that Sam Raimi wrote for Spider-Man 1 and Spider-Man 2. Sam Raimi is actually not a credited writer on either of those films. The first Spider-Man was written by David Kep. Okay. The second one was written by uh, Alvin Sargent with the story by Alfred Goh, Miles M Miller, and Michael Ch uh, Chabon. Chabon, however you say that. Uh, Raimi is actually a credited writer on Spider-Man 3, and it is the only one that he is a credited writer on. Um, so not not to argue that they're good scripts, but uh, certainly Raimi wouldn't have the credit on that one. Whether or not the execution is good or not, that's on Sam Raimi. All right, so overall, um, looking at this fight, um, I think, unfortunately, Linus would be the first one out of it. I think they both kind of tore into him pretty early on, and I he couldn't give a defense later on in the fight that was over either of those two. So it definitely comes down to uh, Norman, o Norman Osborn versus Thanos. And even though I personally don't agree with this change, I'm actually going to have to give the point to Evan because he gave multiple defenses of why the change could work and why the change could build into the expanding universe. And every argument that both Jeremy and Linus gave against Thanos was something to the effect of just a variation on the idea of Thanos would be wasted if he was used earlier than the third Avengers. That was the only thing that stood out to me in either of the counters you tried to give. Whereas I think between Linus and Evan, there was definitely a better back and forth of different points that countered Jeremy. So with that, Evan is going to get the first point in this round uh, of this fight. All right, guys, and with that, we are moving on to round two. So the score is zero to zero to one. However, like I said at the beginning, uh, Evan did preface that he had chosen to sit out of three rounds, and he is actually going to be sitting out of the next two rounds. Um, so these mat fights are going to be just between Linus and Jeremy. And again, for anyone questioning that, the reason is because Evan came in later to this fight than the other two. He didn't have as much time to prepare, and he chose. He thought it. He felt it was a better decision to sit out on the fights he knew were a clear weakness for him rather than focus time on that and just put more towards the questions that he, he had thought he had a chance at winning. So with that, Linus and Jeremy, the second question we have here is best movie from a first-time director. And I think we have two really interesting choices um, that not a lot of people may realize are actually first-time directors. Um, I certainly didn't just because of the clout around both these movies. I wouldn't think that these were first movies from a director, but they are, and we're ready to go. Opening statements, Linus, you're first. Real quick, I'm going to use right. my time extension. I'm going to use the time extension on this one. All right. All right, so Jeremy right, the... is using his time extension, which means the fight goes from five minutes to six minutes. Linus, go ahead with your opening statement. This movie is actually my favorite movie of all time that I'm arguing. Directed by Frank Darabont and was released in 1994. It's The Shawshank Redemption. This is a movie, when you look at it, it has so much complexity, but it's such a simple story of men in prison. But you're watching the movie and you think about it, it doesn't exactly even feel like a prison. And it has such a wide scope of it, such amazing performances, and it just feels like the world is so fulfilled and created, but it's just in a prison. It's in one setting for the most of the film. But with director Frank Darabont in his first ever film, creating that whole setting, creating the amazing performances and creating iconic moments, he was able to give you hope in a place that should feel hopeless. He was able to make you understand why someone would kill himself after leaving prison what someone would be joyful after doing, and you understand why someone's life would be miserable after doing that with Brooks. You understand someone's full-on journey and how staying hopeful in a place that has no hope and is honestly a hell is crazy, and just the pure emotion, what he did with this film is fantastic. All right, and Jeremy, you're up next with your opening statements. Go ahead. All right, like Aaron said... Um... Some people may not realize that the movie that is considered by many, many critics, by a lot of the film-going public in general, to be the greatest film ever made 
is actually a first time film. And that would be, of course, Citizen Kane, directed, starring, produced, co written, everything else by a young genius named Orson Welles. Now, Orson Welles is one of the few filmmakers that came to movies from other mediums. He was in radio, he was on the stage, he already revolutionized those two fields, and he said, great, I'm gonna do movies now. I wanna change everything. I wanna do something that's totally new. Um, one of the great cinematographers of all time, Greg Toland, found out that this young kid was coming to Hollywood to make a movie, and he went to Orson Welles' office and auditioned himself. And this guy was one of the most respected cinematographers in the business and said, look, you don't know anything about movies, Orson. You're new to this, and I want in. I want us to take this opportunity to do something really new with the form. And the two of them together, along with an awesome cast that came over from the Mercury Theater Group, along with a great co-writer and Herman Mankiewicz, the, all of them together set out to change cinema forever, and they did. This movie is singular. There was nothing like it before. There's nothing like it after, although it inspired so many filmmaking techniques, so many acting techniques, so much that we take for granted in movies at large were inspired, were started by Citizen Kane. The whole film noir genre borrowed a lot from Citizen Kane. Citizen Kane is, is not even a film noir genre. And then I think of filmmakers like Quentin Tarantino and many other filmmakers who have uh, experimented with the way you tell stories, with, with uh, nonlinear storytelling, with starting at the beginning, going to the uh, starting it at the end, then beginning your movie there, and then working your way back to that point, jumping back and forth in time, they did all of this in 1941, and it all works. And when you watch this movie now, it's just as current as it ever was. It doesn't feel old. It doesn't feel stodgy. It, the shots, the cinematography, the acting, everything in this movie is amazing. And it were and you can talk and debate and think about this movie endlessly. You never run out of material. And it, it's got real life implications with William Randolph Hearst. There's so much you dig into with it. It is, it is the greatest movie by a first time director. And I think the greatest movie and there is nothing. It is the Citizen Kane of movies. It is Citizen Kane. All right. And with that, we're gonna go into the main fight. Like you said, like said at the beginning of the round, Jeremy is using his extension on this round. So six minutes for the fight. Guys, time begins when you start speaking. We can't argue that either of these films are like I can't say Citizen Kane is bad. I can't. I just I physically cannot say this. I'm going to say <laughs> that Shawshank Redemption is a much better film, though. I think what Shawshank Redemption does, it has the privilege of being m more recent in the past twenty years. Well, it's over twenty years old, but it is more of a recent film per se. I just think what Shawshank Redemption does is going to be timeless. Citizen Kane is timeless yet, but I feel Shawshank Redemption created a scope created characters and just created some universe and frank darabont with both our directors never really went on to the same success of this film yes frank darabont had the walking dead but to come in and make a film like this that was kind of sort of ignored at its time it was nominated for best picture but it lost to forrest gump but now has become shown as one of the greatest films of all time and i believe is the greatest film of all time there's two characters Okay, Shawshank Redemption is a movie that looks backward. This is a movie that takes the genre of the prison film, the genre of the friend film. It takes all of these things that had already been done before. It recycles them. It gives us some easy sentiment. It, it, it is a rehash movie. And uh, the thing about it is... It, it, it looks back, it doesn't really, cinematically doesn't really do anything new, and it cheats with its lead character, Andy Dufresne. Andy Dufresne is a character who, he's wrongly framed, and he's just this good guy, he's just this this unrealistically good, heroic, almost superhero movie plopped but into this But he's not. This, uh, He's not. There were times he was always he was going to kill his. He was almost going to do it. He didn't. He decided this character has flaw to him. This character cheated the system. This character has done bad things in his life, and he was in prison. And he is good there, compared to some of the prisoners. Yes, but he is not a morally perfect character. He he is a guy who is a plot used as a plot device for this whole prison scape of thing. He is not a fully shaded character in the way that her that Charles Foster Kane is. Charles Foster Kane is one of the most emotionally resonant, uh, layered characters you'll ever see. This is a guy that at times is is this incredible person that we want to relate to. He wants to change society. He wants to stand up for poor, poor people. He wants to do all these amazing things. And then at other times he's a monster. He's undone by his own ego. He's undone by his own insecurities. The whole the 
one of the gr first great spoilers, one of the first great twists ever in, in movies was Rosebud, the sled. When at the end of the movie, spoilers, we find out that this that the whole story is so amazing and that it's drawn by this mystery regarding what is Rosebud. It was it was Citizen Kane's last word. It was uh, the, the words that he said on his deathbed. What is Rosebud? We don't know. And that he, it drives you through all these amazing uh, sequences where people that knew Kane tell his story and that every time we get a new story, there's different film filmmaking techniques used and it still is so exciting and so interesting to watch and then when you get to the end with Rosebud you find out Rosebud was the sled that we saw earlier in the movie when he was a kid and you realize this is just all these great things this great man did it doesn't matter because he was thrown away by his mom his childhood was thrown away and it's it's so true and it, and it really resonates and you can watch the movie over and over and see the way that he hurts the people in his life his best friend his two wives the way that he hurts people feels so true and there's so much you learn from it andy dufresne is is for a lot of the movies a plot device i don't believe he's a plot device at all he's a character he's a fantastically written character one of the best characters of all time he shows hope in a hopeless situation he does things to get at the prison and he is he is someone that I, you've never really seen before, in my opinion. You say it takes tropes from other prison movies, which I don't think it does. I think it is original. The whole thing with the Rita Hayworth poster, and you take it out, and it's a tunneled hole out of the wall. I don't think I've seen stuff like that. I haven't seen stuff like Brooks, who was an old man in the prison, and you think prison is this terrible place, and he ends up hanging himself when he gets out to the real world because he's just been in that world so long, and it's taken him away from it, and that's the only society he knows. The Shawshank Prison is a terrible place, and the warden is shown that against that. And there are so many characters, so many things in Shawshank Redemption that works well. I think in Citizen Kane, personally, the character himself is mostly the greatest part of that film and the twist. But I don't know if the things, the supporting characters around it, make that film as great as it does. When you have Red in the Shawshank Redemption, you have the warden, you have Brooks that all craft this fantastic art and piece of cinema. And it ends with one of the greatest endings of all time when they're in Zim Wataneo and they meet each other after all this time. It, Shawshank Redemption shows hopeless. Hope is important and hope will let you free. The tagline of the movie is um, freedom. It's about hope. And it's an amazing movie that shows that hope is relentless and hope can keep you alive. And if you, you have to do anything to survive, your hope can keep you through that. I think the message of Shawshank is more important and it's more well executed. It does. It doesn't have a real realism to it. It's like they throw this platitude of hope out there, and and yeah, it's nice to watch a, a, in this fable. Oh yeah, hope, and it's going to get these guys through. Well, that's not life. Prison destroys men in a way that that movie does not show us. That movie is a fable. It's a it does story. show us. And I will give you with a Brooks. Great it prison. shows us how a prison me. destroyed his life, All right, I will and how he has no life outside of this. Coming back before. to the real world destroyed his life. And I will give you a great prison movie that came before Cool Hand Luke. This is also a movie about a guy who is kind of like Andy Dufresne, is sort of a, a, a Jesus-type character who's thrown into prison. He changes the lives of the people in the Jesus. prison around him. He has a horrible warden he has to go up against. But that character is tragic in a way that feels more real. It feels like it's not a fable. It feels like it's real life. And the things that happen to Luke in that story have, have a resonance and a reality that you just don't feel in this kind of candy-coated Morgan Freeman with his nice voice narrating it, it, it candy coated what that, about the scene with well, rape and uh, is that candy coated for a second Kane has in the incredible supporting performances all the way through. His friend Jed Leland, like the Red, tragic yeah. friendship that those two have, is amazing. The, the way that they love each other, but then they ultimately are broken apart. And Jed, he tries to reach out to Kane. He tries to tell Kane everything that he needs to know to be a better man. And Kane cannot listen to him because of his own insecurity, his own ego. It is, it is moving every time. And it makes me want to be a better man in a way that is real, that isn't a fable, that I'm just watching this sweet fable that I don't really fully believe i'm watching something that feels real and still has resonance and that movie has 50 uh, innovative things to your one or two innovative things you're trying to tell me with the filmmaking and shot strength redemption shot that citizen kane wrote the book in a way that okay is, okay it's time been rivaled. time all right i let it run a little over there but found linus you were up first for closing go ahead Innovation does not make a film great. Shawshank Redemption has innovation, yes. Citizen Kane is looked upon as an innovative film that inspired lots of films. That is why I think, in my opinion, it is looked at one of the greatest films of all time. Shawshank Redemption is one of the greatest films of all times because it is one of the greatest films of all times. It is inspirational, yes. It shows storytelling in new ways, yes. But that is not the purpose of a film. 
films don't need to be realistic just to be amazing. You can look at Empire Strikes Back. You can look at 2001 A Space Odyssey. You can look at many films that don't have realistic aspects to them, and that doesn't make it amazing. Shawshank Redemption has real-life parts into it. Andy Dufresne is raped in prison. He is thrown in that hole. He is taken many hits to himself. He has to climb through powers of shit just to get on the other side and survive. There's realism in Shawshank Redemption, but there's also fantasy because that is a movie. Movies tell stories. Citizen Kane is a story, but in my opinion, it's more of a character study that innovates the filmmaking industry. It is a great film by a first-time director. Yes, Shawshank Redemption is also, but I think Citizen Kane is more of an inspirational film to other films and inspired other films to be better and other films to build upon its success and become better. Shawshank Redemption was released in 1994, and I still don't think other films released have beaten that. Yes, it's a longer time gap between Citizen Kane and when Shawshank has come out, but there's inspiration that a film does and Shawshank Redemption is inspirational and also amazing. And I think will last the test of time and hasn't been repeated in the ways that Citizen Kane has, which is not a knock to Citizen Kane in itself, but its techniques are shown over and over again that rewatching Citizen Kane is more so than seeing it the original time where Shawshank is still holds up the moment that I assume it came out in cinemas because I wasn't born then, but is a fantastic film. What Frank Darabont did creating a universe in a prison, creating hope where hope shouldn't be and creating a drive that inspires anyone. If you feel down that there is hope as anyone, there's the scene when Andy gives, he does the work on the roof and he's instead of payment or anything, he just gives the other people beers on the roof so they can remain hope, have hope in this bad time and continue to get through this. And Red, when he is at his thing to see if he can be taken off prison or not, he gives this whole speech about he knows that they're not going to let him out anyways just because that's how society works. And he knows that he has changed. and He's not the person he is, but they're not going to let him go for saying that. It just is a testament of how situations like that are, how people can change throughout prison and how Red killed someone. But you respond to this character in such a way because of what this has done to him, what this experience and how he got out of there. And it's just a fantastic film. All right. And Jeremy, go ahead. All right. Shawshank Redemption. There are a lot of people that love that movie, but there also is a split opinion on it as well. I remember reading a review at the time by the L.A. uh, LA film critic Kenneth Turan, who said it, it was a big glob of cotton candy. Now, when I say realism, I'm not saying a movie is, if it's realistic, it's better. What I'm saying is, how does a movie resonate? How does a movie last? How does a movie affect its audience? And when you take shortcuts and you focus on a kind of slightly outlandish prison escape plot and a guy who, yes, he's raped and all these horrible things happen to him, but he's still this, just the, the good guy, the guy who always prevails and it's happy and it's hope. And to me, yeah, when I watch that, it, it can feel good. It can make me feel good. But at the end of the day, it kind of, it's going to fade with time. It's, it's not, it doesn't really tell the true story uh, of humanity, of humankind in, in a way that film really can, can do. And with Citizen Kane, we get something that resonates on such a deep level. It works on so many different layers. It tells the story of this man who's a great man, but he's insecure. He hurts everyone around him. And it also takes us, it shows us so much about history, about how history, how times were changing with uh, the early 1900s into the, into the 1920s and 30s with the changing in, in terms of the media and how, the, and, and it resonates today. It's more relevant today than it was then because it, it's all about a man who wanted to control the media. He wanted to tell people, he, he started a war in Cuba in Cuba just for, just for the hell of it, just to make himself feel powerful. And we see that now, the fight over the media. What is true, you know, fake news, all this stuff that we're seeing now. We go back, we see it all in Citizen Kane. And we see so many people in the world today that are insecure, that they're, they're great men, they're great women, but they, they hurt the people around them. Over, We see these cycles over and over again in families. When, when somebody is does evil to a child, that child grows up to do evil if they don't get the proper treatment. All of that humanity and all of that reality is there in Citizen Kane. And to say that it, it's not a movie that resonates is ridiculous. There's, the Bernstein character, the guy that worked for him, who was his friend who loved him, he gives this wonderful speech about how he saw 
how you can remember people in the past, how he saw a woman once and every month for the rest of his life, he remembers seeing this woman and, and the past, when you get older, the way the past lingers with you, the way you regret things, the way you think about what could have been. And that is Cain's struggle. What could have been if his parents had loved him? What could have been if his mom actually wanted him and he wasn't taken away uh, to be raised in this, in this rich lifestyle that he was put into? What could have been? It's such a resonant movie and it gives you so much more and it doesn't cheat. It's true to the psychology of its characters and it's not just a fable. And yes, Shawshank's had 25 years, but Kane's had nearly a century. And this movie is more relevant today. It means more today and it's going to continue to be relevant. And it is really the greatest film of all time. All right. And with that, we finish round two. Uh, great job there, guys. The only like thing that stood out was you talked about the tagline for Shawshank, so I just wanted to look it up to read it word for word. It tagline on the poster was "Hope can set you free." Prison, yeah. I just got my words jumbled a little at some point. Yeah, that's why I looked it up. Um, all right, so that was a really, really close fight between you two guys. Um, and it's kind of a, like a, a, a technicality in my mind of where I'm picking. Here's the thing. Um, Linus did a really, really, really good job in this round. Jeremy got off a lot of solid points against Shawshank Redemption. Really good job of hitting back all of them. I, he hit every point that Jeremy threw against him, and he hit it back with a solid reason against it. But the problem is he didn't really make any hits against Citizen Kane. The only one he got out there was it's loved more for the innovation it brought to filmmaking and maybe not the movie itself. But I think Jeremy more than put that one in. That, along with the passion behind it, as much as I think Linus did a really, really good job fighting for Shawshank, I'm going to have to give it to Jeremy on this one just simply because... Linus wasn't able to put anything really out against Citizen Kane, which I understand is probably a hard thing to ask, but that is part of the game. It is something that you have to do. And Jeremy played a tactic there and it worked. So Jeremy's getting the point for this round. Great job, Linus. Fantastic. Yeah. I didn't have many arguments against Citizen Kane, so I was mostly trying to focus on my film. Definitely. And again, I will say that is one of the best, like, individual fights. That is probably one of the best arguments that I've seen in a while. Wonderful. I say in a while, but we haven't done this for, like, two months. But, I mean, it, over time, <laughs> that's one of the best arguments I've mm -hmm. seen simply because yeah. you did a really, really good job hitting every single point he made. It's clear that both of you are at least very passionate about your films. Yeah. All right, so with that, we move into a question that probably won't bring as much passion, but we're still asking it anyways. <laughs> Um, again, just to preface, Evan is still sitting this round out. He'll be back in for the next question. But the question is, what is the worst January horror movie? And Jeremy, you are going to go ahead and start the opening on this one. Five minutes for the round. What is the worst January horror movie? All right. Well, I'm going to speak on two fronts. One, I'm going to talk about the, the uh, phenomenon of the January movie. So we think of the January and February as being the dumping ground. This is when uh, studios dump movies that they don't believe in, that you know may or may or may they probably weren't not going to screen them for critics. They just dump these movies out, and a lot of these movies are just lazy, shoddily made, kind of crappy movies that people have to suffer through if they have nothing else to see in January. So that's one uh, uh, thing we have to look at here. The other thing is the the idea of the horror movie. Now a lot of horror movies are just really lazy. They're they're going for cheap scares. They're cashing in on past movies and uh it's it's just so much bad when it comes to horror so you've got those two ideas now now i'm gonna give you a movie it came out i believe i, I believe it's 2008 it's called one missed call and this movie is fucking terrible and let me let me just try to talk about that without like just like reliving the horror of having watched this let me try to talk about a why it's horrible as a, in terms of a january release this movie is the script has nothing to it there's no character to it it's a weak script it's something they wrote in like five minutes all of the actors are phoning it in 
There's no good ideas in it. The movie does not make sense. So it's got all, in terms of bad January movies, it's got all that. Now let's talk about it as a horror movie. It's a remake of a Japanese horror movie by the great uh, Japanese filmmaker Takashi Miike, uh, One Missed Call. And it just is a shoddy remake. It just kind of rehashes the original movie, doesn't add anything new. And then in terms of being a bad horror movie, it, it like I said, it doesn't make sense. The, the whole movie, like... Uh, to spoil, ultimately you realize that people are, there's this cell phone that's ringing. People are picking up their phones. They're getting these. They're they're hearing basically a death in the future, and eventually a ghost kills these people. And ultimately we realize that it's a young girl's ghost that's killing them. In the opening scene of the movie, we see a woman get the call, go to her pond, and an adult male arm reaches out of the pond and pulls her and her cat, for I don't know why, into the pond and kills them. So why was there an adult male arm if ultimately we realize there is a little girl? The movie makes no sense. It's, it's, it's so boring. It's never scary. There's bad CG of, like, when people are about to die, there's centipedes coming out of walls. It looks terrible. There's no suspense. You don't care about the characters. The dialogue is laughable, but not in a fun way, like you're laughing at it. It's just a weak, inert, January, bad horror rehash, remake, piece of crap. And it's one of the few movies with 78 reviews that has a 0% on Rotten Tomatoes. No good reviews for this movie, so take that for what it's worth. All right, Linus, you're up next. Go ahead. I'm going to start this off by saying I don't watch many horror movies, especially those ones in January that are terrible, that are just thrown out there to get a couple seats and make their $2 million budget back or whatever. So last year, like I said, I don't watch these January horror movies. I, I don't like to spend my time then. But there was one that was told to be so bad by my friends and everything that I just thought I had to check this out. And that was the Bye Bye Man. And this was one of the weirdest movies I've ever seen. It seems like it's trying to be like a period, like they wanted to do a period piece, but it doesn't fit. Like they didn't have enough budget for it. So they just sloppily put it in modern day, which it obviously doesn't belong in modern day. The character are some of the worst performances I've ever seen. The, it is not even scary. There's like, hours in the movie where like nothing scary or suspenseful happens and it's supposed to be this horror movie with uncompelling characters horrible performances and like not to say i have many other bad january films to reference this on but this was terrible and it makes me never want to watch any other january horror movies again all right and with that we're going to get into the main round guys five minutes when you guys begin speaking all right, I feel I feel uh, I feel very good for you, Linus, that you haven't had to sit through all these January horrible horror movies because you picked one that really isn't. You, there's so many that are worse than that one. Uh, let me tell you, the Bye Bye Man. It has things that work in it. It's got a fantastic what? sequence with Lee Wanell, the writer of Saw, where something gets into his head. We don't know who he is. We don't know what's going on, and he just kills his wife. He kills his neighbors. It's a really shocking scene that works. And then you've got the great. Uh, Doug Jones, who I'm going to talk about later in The Shape of Water, playing the Bye Bye Man, one of the, the great artists in terms of doing physical monster characters from all the Guillermo del Toro movies and so many other movies. You get Doug Jones in this movie. The acting, yeah, the acting isn't good. That's true of a lot of horror movies, but it's got some cool ideas. It's got this concept of this guy that, that can get into people's minds, and it's got it's this a good decent hook. concept, but it, it's not uh, Yeah, it, it, it's conveyed. got this hook of don't think what was it don't think don't say his name they say the same words over and over as he's driving them insane and that's a creepy idea there's nothing in one missed call of uh, they rip off the idea from the ring that you see a, you know you get a call and then you die a few days later that's the ring it's not original they ripped it off the movie has no tension to it there's a scene that drags on for about 10 minutes in one missed call where the, the, girl, uh, the lead character is is upset because these things have been happening and the, and the detective comes in to comfort her and there's supposed to be sexual tension there's no heat between these two actors they sit on a bed you think maybe they want to sleep together but she just talks about how she's sad and these bad things are happening nothing happens in this scene and in, in the middle of this movie and and it's just one of those scenes that adds to making this 79 minute movie feel like it's eight hours long. That movie is endless. There are no good ideas in it. And, you know, you can even kind of revel in some of the bad acting in the Bye Bye Man. There's some kind of cheesy stuff that you can kind of have some fun with. There's no fun. There's no life. There's no joy in One Missed Call. It's a totally phoned in on every level. And it takes a great actor, Ed Burns, who I like from Saving Private Ryan, good filmmaker, and he is just terrible. He has nothing in that movie. And you can see every scene of that movie, Ed Burns going, why am I here? Why am I doing this? What happened to my career? 
like you said exactly, your film has good actors in it too. Yes, Doug Jones is in this film, but I'm sure Doug Jones wishes he was not in this film. I've seen interviews. I think, he, he had a lot of fun playing that character. I mean, you have to say that. What are you going to say on the interview? Yeah, the film was terrible. I'm sad I was in it. It wasn't fun. You're not going to see that from Ed Burns. <laughs> believe me. There's no Ed I Burns know. in it. <laughs> it just shows that he was more charismatic in interviews. So I don't know if that says the testify of the film. But I think some of the performances in The Bible Man are just terrible. Some of the sequences, like the whole train track sequence, is god-awful. That It's something in cinema that I don't think should ever be put to the screen. There's the same scene in One Missed Call where uh, a woman gets hit by a subway and it's uh, there's bad CG. Believe me, it's way worse than you're seeing. They're like every bad thing that you're saying, like my movie has something that's 10 times worse. It's it's a miserable movie. It's it's everything that's wrong with film. There are no new ideas. Everything's a rehash. People phone but, stuff in. They push stuff out into the theaters to try to make a quick buck. Bye bye, man. They were trying. They had a concept. They had an idea. They it didn't execute it, though. There Execution. Worst movies. Mine is one of them. But yours was based off a good film. The original was good. It's a remake, so it had some plot elements that w- could have possibly worked. With the Buy My Man, if they had the budget, maybe it could have possibly worked, but they didn't have what they wanted to do with it. So it's kind of thrown together sloppily. Yours was, was a remake that could have potential and could have some great elements of the original in it because the original was great. But with the Buy My Man, there's no original. It's just this terrible thing by itself. And the premise of the Buy My Man is decent, but it was executed horribly. And that's all that matters. Even if it has a somewhat decent present, when you say it, it's still kind of stupid. Just saying someone's name. It's the worst version of the whole Bloody Mary type thing. Bye you Bye Man. Admitted- you just admitted your movie has a decent premise that wasn't executed very well. My movie it could has have a had terrible a premise. It, 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 it was it's the, not when it's, it's based off a good premise. Though. Yours has best. a good premise. It's not a good premise, and it's executed the, badly. It's, you said you it, love the original. It's worse on the premise runs. is from the original, is it not? It is, but it's not a very. That the only reason the original that works is the at premise all is because from the, original. the director is a good director, and he had good actors, and his and and it had some. So it has uh, a good premise though, because it was based off a good film. But it's not a good premise, and that's proven in the in the remake that it's a terrible premise, that it doesn't work, that it's a rehash. There's no good filmmaking like you had in the original. It's just a waste of time. And your movie, it has the great Faye Dunaway gets an effective scene, and it. it has some cool things. But she's and not great, movie, and she's in it. You, yeah, there's people, people did the not believe the people that made my movie did not believe in the movie they were making. They didn't care about it. There was no passion from anyone involved. Your movie, these people, they wanted to make a movie. They got Faye Dunaway. They got Lee Whannell. They were trying. They got Doug Jones, and he does have some effective moments in that For movie. For a paycheck, they were, they were paid to do and this movie. Doug Jones was paid for One Missed Call. One Missed Call is devoid of anything. It is. It is. A, I, I sat through this movie for this argument. I'm going to be honest with you, and I felt like my soul was being sucked out. There's nothing fun. There's nothing cool. There's nothing. Oh, those bad actors. You can laugh at it. I mean, that's what you do in horror movies. You laugh at things. things okay, and time but my movie is just a a life sucker all right that is time on the fight jeremy you're going to be up first for closing go ahead yeah that you know like i said before like bye bye man it it's not you know there are a lot of horror movies that don't fully work but if you can get a movie that has a good villain a good concept good sequences great actors like Faye Dunaway that are given some good material she has a cool scene you know she's sitting on a rocking chair and she gets to talk about this thing that's been haunting people for years and years that that keeps resurfacing it's got this idea that if you share a piece of of information with someone else it can infect their mind this person can infect people through their minds that's an interesting idea and you can kind of get on board with that and the horror elements of that and you can also laugh at some of the cheesiness of it that's what you want from that's all you can really ask for from from some horror movies bye bye man delivers that my movie is a bad premise no one is invested in it it goes on forever it's not ever scary it makes no sense when you get to the end and it's the little girl it it betrays so much of what came before it's it's like they were just throwing scenes in there that don't even connect and it it really hurt like Faye Dunaway gets a cool scene in Bye Bye Man and she's out and that's fun. But Ed Burns is is strung through this whole movie, saddled with terrible dialogue. And and really his career was in the, the trash shoot at that point and it's only gotten worse. And it's so sad to watch a movie like that and realize that you can take these good actors, these people that have done great things like Saving Bribe Ryan and see how far their career sinks because it's painful. And that movie is, it's boring. It's not scary. It's painful. It's not a, you want in a horror movie, you want some cool ideas and you want some fun, bad, maybe, you know, you can fun, bad in horror movies is something you can ask you. There's no fun, bad in one missed call. One missed call is cynical, horrible, painful, life sucking time, waste of time. And I want my, I want my 78 or 79 minutes back. Cause that movie hurts. 
All right, Linus, go ahead. All right, with the Bye Bye Man, they had someone probably came up with the concept, and that's like, let's th- fling it into here theaters. Let's get like two decent actors, and let's just make it as horribly as we can, as quickly as we can, just to get paychecks out of it. The Bye Bye Man probably was a concept someone came up with that was somewhat decent, but was horribly executed and used only for a paycheck. With your film, it was a remake, so they thought, hey, this film worked well in another way. Let's bring it over to this market and redo it in this sort of way. Maybe it didn't go well, it didn't offer some of the things that the original offered. Yeah, sure, but I think having the premise and having more of a idea of what they could have done with it were Bye Bye Man. It's like they wanted to do something else and it's evidence and it wasn't in the film. So I think that makes it worse because you just look at it. It's like that is not what it was going to be. One Last Call was taken from another film and they did what they probably wanted to do and there's a better version out there. So I could just watch the original version and not have to worry about One Missed Call. The Bye Bye Man is this horrible movie that came out there and there's no really redeeming qualities in my opinion. Some of the performances like Cassidra Bonas is one of the worst performances I've seen. It is terrible. I'm sure that is one of the worst performances in horror films. And not only is the Bye Bye Man seen, it is one of these films that made me against a whole entire genre. I never want to go back to watch these cheap horror movies because of the Bye Bye Man. I don't know why I saw it in the first place, and it makes me never want to see these movies again. It's turning me against horror films. Your film might be terrible, but it probably has some good elements from the remake because if the remake is a good film capturing part of it even if it is sort of just the capture from the remake is good to its favor and you could have just watched the remake instead the bye bye man is a concept that was not executed how they wanted to horrible performances they got some decent actors and only for a paycheck and it doesn't work in any way all right and with that that is the end of round three just some quick fact checks because stuff was brought up Rotten Tomatoes scores. One Missed Call has a 0% on 80 reviews. The yeah. Bye Bye Man got a 23% on 71 reviews. Um, budgets were also talked about, so I decided to look those up. One Missed Call was made for $20 million. The Bye Bye Man was made for $7.4 million. Um, there was one other thing. Oh, uh, Jeremy, uh, you said you want your 78 or 79 minutes back. You can have it, because but the movie's 87 minutes. You're going to need a little more than that. Ah. And well, take the credit. And, it's probably like eighty-two. It's it's in the ballpark. <laughs> and uh, also, uh, when talking about the Bye Bye Man, the tagline that they were running with is "Don't think it, don't say it." That's what I was trying don't to remember. Think yeah. it. That that's the marketing thing they ran with, and that's yeah, what they used in the movie. the movie too. Yeah. Um. Okay. So I I didn't see it, but I can assume. Um. All right, then. So with that, guys, uh, once again, another good round. Uh, more passion than I thought for movies nobody wants to watch. Um, the arguments themselves were were very close. Um, but I think I'm, I think I'm going to have to give it to Jeremy on that one. I think he just sold it just a little bit more than Linus did on that fight. But it was very, very close. Um, you guys both did really well. Um, but yeah, I think I'm going to have to give it to Jeremy on that one. I think he, he was just selling why his movie was bad a little bit more. And I think, it, again, I haven't seen either of them, so I can't judge specifically. But he could at least pull something out and be like, this wasn't awful. They might have tried, which this could do, again, probably haven't seen the movie. But... Yeah, fortunately, that's the way it's going to go. And so with that, we are going to go ahead and move into question four, which does bring Evan back into the fight now. I'm back. All right, and with, there he is. And with that, guys, um, the fourth question we have here is, Netflix is a company that is doing bigger and better things. Producing more TV shows and more original movies now than ever before. They're also going to festivals and purchasing rights to films to air solely on their um, platform. They're really uh, kind of spearheading of uh, streaming websites producing their own content. And so we decided to ask the question with tons of movies coming out every single month on Netflix, what is the most exciting upcoming movie being uh, made or produced by Netflix or distributed by Netflix, but just 
just generally speaking, what is the most exciting upcoming movie? Because I think we have something that falls under all three types of these three movies. But what is the most exciting upcoming movie coming from Netflix? Uh, Evan, you are going to go first on this one. What is the most exciting upcoming movie made by Netflix? So I'm pretty sure I have the most interesting one out of the three of us because I have a movie that hasn't even been completely um, – has a title or any type of um, – you know, just, just it, it hasn't had its official like, hey, this is happening. But we they, we have confirmation from Netflix that there is a movie that is directed by Dan Gilroy and is starring Jake Gyllenhaal and Rene Russo. And it, it and the writer itself is Dan Gilroy. Now, if you're not excited for this movie, I think they're going up upon your head. The last time we had this crew together, we got a movie that everybody says that is snubbed for either their performances. Or for or for the um, best picture Oscar in Nightcrawler. Nightcrawler is probably one of the most unsettling films I have ever seen. And the fact that this crew is coming back together again and being put onto a Netflix plat platform where Nightcrawler succeeded a lot back in 2014 is exceptional. Yes, the other two movies that the that the others have are are very well made films. They just they they don't stack up to the facts that we have an up and coming director who has done a marvelous job with with the other two here. All right, Jeremy, you're up next. Go ahead. All right. Uh, when, I, when it comes to upcoming movies that I'm looking forward to, I'm always about um, a filmmaker that, that I love, that I've seen do some amazing things, and then they're going to do something new uh, in a new arena. And it, it can be so exciting when you, when you get a great filmmaker and they do something totally new. They get a new opportunity. And I am picking a movie called Apostle that was directed by Gareth Evans. Not Edwards, Evans. Gareth Evans did the Raid Redemption and the Raid to Berendal, two great martial arts movies that were made in Indonesia. And they're, they're just fantastic movies. He's such a great physical filmmaker working in that genre. And they told great stories. There were emotional moments. Those movies had so much. They were so innovative. They made such an impact that actors from those movies ended up in the Star Wars universe. They're, to take low-budget martial arts movies made in another country and have that kind of huge impact in Hollywood is pretty amazing. So, you know, and then I also will throw in that there was a horror anthology called VHS2, which uh, Gareth Evans did a sequence in that is just terrible. I just talked about bad horror. VHS2 is a sequence that is great horror. It's just so unsettling. It's so awesome. Oh, my God, it's amazing. Just great visceral filmmaking for if you like horror, you need to watch that sequence in VHS2. It's so great. So anyway. Gareth Evans is moving into an English language film. He's gonna he's making a movie that will be played on Netflix, and it stars one of my favorite actors uh, working today, one of the great upcoming actors, Dan Stevens. It takes place in 1905, and it's about a man who goes to an island where there is a religious cult, and he's trying to uncover. I believe his his uh, sister was kidnapped. He's trying to uncover what's going on here, and I think there's so much possibility. There could be gruesome horror. There could be suspense. There's so much from this filmmaker that many talents he has, and he's going to be doing this cool thing. It's an original story. It takes place in, like I said, in the early 1900s. It's. I think it could be really uh, atmospheric, awesome, thrilling. There could be action. I don't know. There's so many, so much potential here. And to take a great actor like Dan Stevens, pair him with this, with this filmmaker. And I've been waiting for this guy's next movie for a while. I am just so pumped, so excited. This is going to be something new. And the fact that Netflix would would, would do something like this really speaks well for them. All right, and Linus, go ahead. All right, I think I've probably got the obvious pick for this question, and the obvious pick is sometimes definitely the right pick, and that is the Martin Scorsese's The Irishman. Netflix getting this film is fantastic in many ways. The cast The Irishman has. This film not only is my most anticipated Netflix film, it's one of my most anticipated films coming out. I believe it's coming out in 2019 now. It was pushed back. But it's one of my most anticipated films coming out, period. I love what Scorsese does with his films, with actors that he does. And we see reunions with Scorsese with actors like Pesci is coming back. Joe Pe Pesci, who has been retired for many years, coming back to a film is one of the things that I've wanted for years. And to see him come back in this film just makes me so happy and having De Niro and Pacino in this film together, those three, those four Scorsese, De Niro, Pacino and Pesci all together just is going to make this fantastic film. And it being on Netflix is going to have it 
have more boundaries that it maybe couldn't cross in the theater. And Netflix is giving it budgets that students would not give Martin Scorsese. It is letting him do the Benjamin Button S technology with De Niro and Pacino that he wasn't able to get. So having this film on Netflix is why is amazing. That's why it is the most anticipated Netflix film. What Netflix is giving him and what he's going to do with it on Netflix opposed to a theater, where I think a lot of your, both your films could have worked in a theater. All right. And with that, guys, we're going to move into the main round. Six minutes on the clock when you guys begin speaking. All right. Uh, I'll go first here. First off, here's the thing with The Irishman. The fact that Netflix is willing to risk $125 million on this movie means I feel like they're putting too much of their eggs in one basket, and that could really hurt them financially. And look, we do want to support these Netflix films, but a $125 million budget on something where, where from what we know, what you just told me, Joe Pesci has been retired and it's coming back, so he might give a flopping performance, a performance that disappoints many because he hasn't been because he hasn't been practicing in a while. It's like a, it's like a baseball player coming back to hit for dh and people are surprised that he's striking out he's striking out because he hasn't been played in a while um and then also the last performances that pacino and denier have been in they have been falling asleep in like you're, you're it, it's it's almost like the dumber and dumber effects you know you, you did the two fantastic actors of jeff daniels and um and jim carrey coming back together but the past movies that they were in, they were falling asleep in, and Dumb and Dumber 2 was a terrible movie. And we're going to get another t- – like, I don't think it's going to be a terrible movie, but the, 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 but the performances, they're going to be as falling asleep in it, and it's just not going to be good. And the thing with Apostle, I was thinking about this because – because, look, uh, Gareth Evans made two fantastic movies in Raid 1 and Raid 2. I personally haven't seen that uh, VH2 segment yet, and I'm not a big fan of horror. But I, <laughs> I guess here's the thing. You're, you're, you're talking about impacts that, you know – that he had putting the characters and putting those actors in Star Wars movies. I think they're put in there because Star Wars needs that type of diversity. I wasn't sure if maybe it's the impact of the Raid 2, but they would have gotten some type of different work somewhere else. Um, and the unsettling part, I don't think there's really anything unsettling about the two Raid movies. Yes, you could say you know they're emotional, X, Y, and Z, but th- I don't think the raid is a com- the two raid movies are a, a complete representation of what this apostle movie needs to be especially from the description that i've been read and it, it like it you know it incurs some system religious cool i feel like it's too much of a risk for netflix to take right now especially when you're in the spot of there there's a lot of streaming competition about to evolve so i don't th- i don't think it's the best move for netflix I think Evan's sort of right in that point. I think that The Apostle is probably going to be a forgotten film on Netflix, where if it came out in theaters, I think maybe it would have gotten some buzz, and the people who really love it would have come back to the theaters, and it probably would have been more successful in that sense. Whether on Netflix, it could have just been buried behind tons of other big blockbuster films or th- that are on Netflix right now. But if it's some special independent film that's in theaters, I think it would have been much more successful, like how The Raid and The Raid 2 transferred over to the American audience and how many people have latched onto that. And um, with the Irishman, I understand your point, Evan, saying that De Niro and Pacino haven't given amazing performances yet, recently. But those directors they've worked with have not been Martin Scorsese. Martin Scorsese has not lost it. That's the thing. A lot of directors aging that you can see kind of lose their stride or not doing as well in their older age. But Martin Scorsese is still doing fantastic films. Just look at The Wolf of Wall Street that came out recently. That is an amazing film. And Joe Pesci coming out of retirement might not be as good. With that point, I would say Joe Pesci is not someone who's going to come out of retirement to half-ass a role. He was said that he wasn't going to do this film, but I guess he was convinced into it, and now he is doing this film. He's, he's not going to come into money. the film that... They said, here's X amount of dollars. Here's your money. Run with it. No, he's, he, he has enough money. He's not the type of person that's going to do a role for money. Joe Pesci's not. He would have had tons of roles. He would have done like the... Harry spinoff from Home Alone or something like that if he wanted money. He's doing this because Martin Scorsese convinced him to, and he has not lost his acting chops. Also, also let's talk about Martin Scorsese. He, Martin Scorsese's okay. last film was Silence, and that was a sleeper film. Silence like, is a good I, film, I, I but it's right. forgotten. That's why having this right. on Netflix with the big platform and the big news around it and the budget he has given and the creative freedom he has given on Netflix is giving him much more than what a studio would let him do with a film. I'm terrified of the Irishman. They're, they've announced they're doing this de-aging thing. 
though so they're gonna they're gonna take these older actors and they're gonna use uh computer effects to de-age them and make them younger rather than hiring actors to play them in younger age and i don't think this has really ever worked yet and and this type of movie it's like maybe it kind of works in something like rogue one and we can kind of go along with it because it's a fantasy and it's in space but to see a, a de-aged computer 25 year old robert de niro terrifies me and i, I just don't think that's gonna work i think that, that <laughs> it, it will ter- work though they're we're delaying it. And I will tell you one to work thing. On the technology uh, from a historical perspective, this movie, um, Al Pacino plays Jimmy Hoffa. The whole movie is about who killed Jimmy Hoffa. It's about him. Well, Jimmy Hoffa was 62 when he died, and we're going to be seeing him throughout his whole life at younger ages. Al Pacino is almost 80. It's terrible casting. And Al Pacino, when he's miscast, is really bad. He's been bad in a lot of movies lately. He's phoned it in, and I'm just terrified of how wrong this movie could go. And you talk about The Wolf of Wall Street. That movie's bloated. It's, it's three hours long. It shouldn't be. Casino with De Niro and Pesci is... The over three hours long it's bloated but uh, scorsese doesn't know how to edit his film sometimes they go yeah. too long they get also too bloated and I- jimmy to add on to that man, point the, the last time scorsese best, works with practical gaming. yeah the last time now, scorsese Evan, works with vfx you, it's interesting that we don't know anything about your movie why? Yeah, there's why, nothing why about your movie. We Give me a second. We don't know anything. How I'm not excited for just I cats. Don't know anything about. Give me a director. second here. But I do want to add on to that Martin Scorsese. I do want to add on to that Martin Scorsese point. Other um, than it's in the art world, I know nothing about this movie. Nothing to get me excited. And the movie may not even happen. When you get a movie announced and they don't have any details and they haven't announced the script and they haven't announced shooting dates, it may not even ever happen. So I can't get excited about it. And let me tell you something about Dan Gilroy. Dan Gilroy made Nightcrawler and then this year he made Roman J. Israel Esquire, which is a muddled movie. It's got some split uh, uh, reaction from critics. It doesn't fully work. He tries to do things that don't work. It has a great Denzel Washington performance, but that's kind of all it has going for it. Like overall, like that was a miss fire the second movie so i don't have the confidence in him going forward that i do with uh Gary okay Hattie. and with that that, that is time works of art that i that were awesome time and time time, time. Art, sorry. Right. Jeremy, that's time sorry can you hear me? damn this is right. this is getting <laughs> i was just getting started sorry <laughs> Should have so guess, this one, with that uh evan we're gonna go to you first for closing arguments go ahead okay so I'm getting all your points, and I understand what you mean, you know, it might not even come out. Nightcrawler was a very quickly shot, very quickly edited, and very quickly put out film. Um, That's something to note. This film will get done on time. Steven Spielberg put out the post, a very high production type movie within a year. That, it's possible. Like, people say these Hollywood movies take three, three, two years. No, it can be done within six months if needed. Look, this film is going to get shot, it's going to get done. Um... Also, I do want to add on to that uh, Martin Scorsese point. The last time he works with special effects was with Hugo, and they look terrible. So, you know, you want to, you know, say the Benjamin Button thing. It might look terrible, and that's going to take away from this whole Netflix thing, especially for the fact that we're looking at a small screen and not a big screen. And here's the thing with Postal. The idea that Netflix needs to be taking this big of a risk is, one, a very terrible business move because – Whenever you add into this whole religious thing and, and the whole cult-like behavior, it, it's especially in today's scale, scope and landscape, it it could really backfire. And there's not really that big, like there's not really that big guy in there except for Dan Stevens. And Dan Stevens has, in my opinion, been a meh actor. Like he's done a few good roles, but he hasn't been exceptional in anything. Uh, you might disagree with that, but like there's nothing I'm like that guy deserves an Oscar for. Where, you know, I can point out two two actors in, in mine where it's like, yeah, Dan, um, and actually, I do want to talk about this. Dan Gilroy's filmography, every time he has directed a movie, which has been twice to be fair, either a guy deserved an Oscar, Rene Russo was nominated for an Oscar, and Denzel Washington was nominated for an Oscar. He knows how to direct the acting. So no matter what, we are going to get great performances out of these people. And I think that's important going forward into this. So... Look, I feel like the movies that you guys have, um, The Irishman just has too bloated of a budget. It's it, it's being pushed back, which is a scary thing. And Martin Scorsese just doesn't know how to do uh, visual effects, and it's people who are outdated. And doing the possible is just too much of a risk for Netflix to do a movie like this and, and to tr- and to trust Gareth Evans in, in a style that he's never done before. It, it it's just too much of a risky move. At least with Dan Gilroy, we know he's back working with the people that he is comfortable with, and we are going to get another fantastic film. Maybe you're up next for closing. Go ahead. 
Okay, just to respond real quick, uh, my movie is not a huge risk for Netflix. This isn't a big bloated budget movie. This is a movie by a, a basically an independent filmmaker with a n- not a huge cast with a huge payroll. This is kind of a small movie, and I think it's an opportunity for them to do something new, to do something interesting. And you ta- when I was talking about the possibility of it being unsettling, I was referring to that VHS2 segment, which is about a religious cult. It's about people that go to visit a religious cult and horrible supernatural things start happening. Now, I don't think that's what Apostle's probably going to be. I think Apostle's probably going to be a more uh, realistic story, but I don't know. It could end up being supernatural, which he's shown he could do awesome. It could be an action movie. It could turn out that Dan Stevens got got to get into some fights with some people. That could and Dan Stevens was in a fantastic indie movie called The Guest, where he he was this soldier who uh, had been programmed by the government and he and he went crazy and was kicking people's asses and doing all these terrifying things. Dan Stevens can be such and he and he's done like Downton Abbey, like British kind of highfalutin stuff. He's got great range. You give this young upcoming actor the opportunity, he can knock it out of the park. This movie has so much potential. It's it's unique. It's it, it, it's something that could be really cool. And Gareth Evans and Dan Stevens both have so many tools in their arsenal that they can really come up with something cool. And the idea of the religious cult being risky, uh, there, there are a lot of great movies about uh, religious topics uh, that, you know, there are horror movies, there are dramas. This is something that a talented filmmaker can talk tackle and there's a lot of different approaches he can take. And I trust that, you know, after doing the, the movies that he's done before, that Gareth Evans is going to take a smart approach, come up with something cool, something that isn't, you know, going to turn people off. He makes exciting, interesting uh, movies that are engaging, and he's going to do that here. And I'm so excited. For, there's so much promise. And, uh, you know, I don't, like I said, Roman J. Israel didn't set the world on fire. So I don't, and I don't even know what this movie he's doing is going to be. And then in terms of, like I said, with the, the Irishman, there's so many problems there with the, trying this new technology and all these different things that they're doing. That movie could really go wrong and it could be another bloated movie. And I agree with the Joe Pesci point. He hasn't acted in years. He's going to be de-aged. It could be really bad. My movie has a lot more promise and a lot more potential and a lot more positives going for it. All right, Linus, go ahead. Okay. There's a reason that this film is having delays, and it is a good reason. Just because Martin Scorsese is needing to make this film perfect. With the budget he has, he is proving that he can do this technology right. Even though there might be some problems coming up in the news of the film, and the technology might be a little scary. Looking at all the other films Netflix is coming out with, this is obviously on the list of the most exciting. There's no other film with a director to the caliber of Martin Scorsese, and that is why it simply excites me. Martin Scorsese is trying something new with his career and taking a film without studio interference like other studios would do. If he took this film to studios, they'd be like, we're not giving you a $100 million budget. You can do the CGI cheaper, and it's going to turn out worse. With Netflix, they're letting him go all at it, and Netflix has shown to have good effects in some of their shows. Yes, Hugo hasn't been the great effects, but he can learn on this. He can hire better people to get this effects differently, and this is different effects. Joe Pesci has shown to be a fantastic actor, and there is no proving that people lose their acting talent when they grow older. It is more a chance of they are less passionate about it. And Joe Pesci is not going to come to this role if he is not passionate about it. Martin Scorsese is one of the greatest directors of all time. Hearing he's going to direct a movie is amazing. With your film, Jeremy... I don't know if Netflix is the best place for it. That's why I'm not exactly so excited for it. I think having an independent release on itself would probably be better for the film. And with Evan's film, sure, the director has promise, but I haven't seen enough from him to, sit, to just hear his name being attached to a film with actors to get me excited for it. Martin Scorsese has that. Plus, the story it is based on is fantastic. And you might say the casting is wrong, but it's Martin Scorsese. He can change it around a little. He's The character is going to be a little bit older in the film. And the de-acting technology is going to work. He's not going to go for this. He's never had a film that failed so drastically. And he's delaying it to make sure it will be perfect. He got all the actors he wanted to be into it. Joe Pesci didn't want to do it, but he convinced him to do it. He is doing this the way he wants to, with the budget he wants to, the put on the film he wants to and that excites me more than most films the passion he has behind this film excites me in itself and there's no other films on netflix that has this much passion or this much talent behind it all right guys and with that we have the end of round four another great round between all three competitors this one was a tough one 
Um, I think overall in this round, the um, defense, the def or sorry, the offenses were better than the defenses. I don't think there was a whole, necessarily a whole lot of um amazing defending or it was more yeah. you guys kind of picked one or two points and stuck with it. Evan's defense of his movie was this is a, uh, a director and a crew that we've seen work together before and it made great results before. So it can make great results. Now Linus was more going off of the past of you have Scorsese and you have a great cast reuniting together and Scorsese is getting the freedom that a studio may not let him that he's getting with Netflix and Jeremy's was more, we have a good actor in Dan Stevens, uh, the follow-up of Gareth Evans and the previous Raid films. So there was a whole lot with that. I think also we don't know a whole lot about any of these movies, so there is a bit of an issue trying to argue that there. So I do understand the repetition of points. But when I look simply at attacks, like solid attacks against the other movies... Um... And if I'm looking just simply, because I think all of these are varying degrees of attack success, Evan simply did put the most out there, so I'm going to give Evan the point on this one. Because oh, um, I think the defenses, the defenses and the attacks were all on equal level. It was just at that point Evan simply had more attacks, so that's what brings it down to it. Um, but another great round for all of you guys. Damn, I needed that one. <laughs> all right, guys. So we are halfway through the game right now. Uh, currently, the score is uh, two to Jeremy, two to Evan, zero for Linus, but that does not mean Linus is out. We still have four more questions, so this could be anybody's game here. I move into uh, question number five, just kind of a random question I thought up. What is the best fourth film in a franchise? And with that, we are going to have uh, Linus start this question fourth film in a franchise all right this is a very tough question because when you look at it a lot of the fourth films and franchises are mostly like fourth horror movies that are made with really cheap budgets that no one really likes but there are some good ones if you really look deep and it's mostly involved in big franchises and the franchise i chose the best fourth film known is harry potter and harry potter is a franchise that i'm a fan of i don't think it's the greatest franchise of all time I think it's overrated in a lot of senses, but I think this fourth one is probably one of the best films in the entire franchise for what it does. With It makes a whole new environment. It changes the game with the franchise. It's probably the most unique story, and it added depth that we've never really seen in this franchise before with deaths of characters like Cedric Diggory and what honestly happens with the games. All the spectacle that we see in this film, the effects, the beauty, the acting, and it's just one of those films in the franchise that I think stands out more so than any of the other ones. And when I look at fourth films in a franchise, this is one that really makes me... In a fourth film in a franchise, a lot of times they lose their muster. But this one definitely picks up speed and it drives it home more so and it makes you more interested in the later films in the franchise. Continuing the path on to the story and just making the films better as the overall franchise. All right, and we'll move on to Evan, best fourth film in a franchise. I'm probably going to be having the most controversial answer out of any of these people, and it's probably going to be talks about, which is perfectly fine. But we have episode four, Star Wars, and you hope. Um, look, George Lucas thinks it's the fourth film in the franchise. When it carried on over to Disney, it's still called episode four, and you hope. So that's two very big, massive corporate opinions thinking that. So it is the fourth film in the franchise that kind of boggles that argument down there. And it, look, and, and if you just want to talk about it, it's a film that started blockbuster cinema. You could say, yeah, J J Jaws did, blah, blah, blah. But like when it comes to merchandise, when it comes to space offers, when it comes to fantasy and mixing all those things together, special effects and how and how it impacted cinema there, we're, we're no longer talking about how something impacted a franchise. We're talking about how something impacted cinema. And it, it look, it, it's... You know, it's just something that's very hard to argue against because you're talking about something that is on AFI's top 100 list, as in both of your films aren't on. And 
Look, people say it got rigged for the Oscar versus Annie Hall. It's just Star Wars Episode Four is a film that started many things, and it was a very well told story and it's something that sparks many, many directors and creators to make films just like it. Okay, and Jeremy, go ahead. All right. Well, I picked a movie that uh, is the fourth installment in the Star Trek franchise, uh, Star Trek The Voyage Home. And this was the highest grossing, uh, m most successful movie of the original franchise of the first six films of Star Trek movies. It's, it, it is also a movie that continued uh, an ongoing, actually ended kind of an ongoing storyline that was started in Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. Uh, it kind of wrapped up a storyline that was going on and... It's it, to me, it is the best fourth film because a, it continues on this long going story from the old TV show from the previous three films. Uh, it it continues that story and it understands its characters. It builds on its characters. It has uh, payoffs in its characters and it took a really risky left turn. We had in, in Star Trek, in the previous Star Trek films, they were kind of adventure stories in space, kind of space opera type stuff. And then Leonard Nimoy came in and in Star Trek three, he was given a film to make. He, he made this kind of in-between movie uh, as director, kind of finished, you know, bringing uh, Spock had died in two. He brought Spock back in three. And then he kind of that when that movie was enough of a hit, he kind of got to do what he wanted in Star Trek four. And he said, let's try something new. And he came up with this idea that uh, th the whole universe is in jeopardy because there's this satellite that's destroying all of the technology. And this could jeopardize life as we know it in the future. And they find the signal is actually communicating with humpback whales. It's a humpback whale speech. And we've killed all the humpback whales in the future because we're destroying the, the planet. So they have to go back to the past and they have to get humpback whales. It's a little, you know, it comes off a little silly, but when you watch the movie, it's fun. And it's got this great message about us coming together. There's no like villain really, which is so innovative. It's, it's just what we do, our planet, what we do to each other, that's the villain. And it's just these, these great, uh, this great story of these people uh, doing this great thing. It's got a great message about ecology, about the world. And these characters grew so much. These actors grew so much. They loved each other. They connected. They're rich. It's a funny movie. It's a warm movie. It's a human movie. And it, and it was a movie that even if you don't like Star Trek, if you don't like blockbuster type movies, you can enjoy this movie. It's got humor. It's got warmth. It's got a great message. My mom hated all those kind of movies and she liked Star Trek 4. Um, there's a female character who is uh, the guardian of the whales that uh, Kirk has a love story with. Like my mom connected to this woman, this woman who cares about the world. This was a big thing in the 80s. It's a big thing now. And it's a wonderful war movie. And it, it is the best fourth film. It moves everything forward. And it brings some things to a close. All right. And with that, guys, we're going to go into the fight. Six minutes on the clock. Time starts. One of you begins speaking. Start. So, okay. Um, first thing first. Space whales. Really, dude, you know that's like one of the most down upon looks things on Star Trek. Don't even get me started there. And it, you said this was a movie that wraps things up. Mm, the fourth movie out of a six movie trilogy, you don't want your fourth movie wrapping things up. No, it, it wraps some things up that that and then it set up other things. It was set up the the uh Spock storyline that he had died, he had come back, and this is him rediscovering who he is. And it was a wonderful arc that they continued, and then they were able to set up new things in the next movie. Also, so. your 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 argument that Star Trek, uh, you know, was the highest grossing film in the original trilogy, that's fair. But as we've seen again with a uh, Transformers: Age of Extinction, that's usually not. Sometimes that's not a very good common denominator. It, it resonated with people. People Person enjoyed it. It it spoke to people it's in a new way that the franchise hadn't before, and that's why it made the money that it made, and that's why it was successful. And the movies that were not as well liked, like Star Trek V, did not uh, have the same gross because they weren't as good films. They weren't the best, uh, most exciting fourth film. They weren't the great film that the fourth one was. And in terms of you talking about the whales, it might come off silly, but it, but it, it, it's, it's something unique. It's something we hadn't seen before. And people talk warmly about the one with the whales. Star Trek fans say, "Oh, the one with the whales. I like that Star one." Trek it's, it might come off silly, but it, Star it, Trek it's fans. cool. And, yeah, and it's it, forgettable. And people that don't like Star Trek, like my mom. Oh yeah, so, that Star Trek movie with the whales. That one was actually good that it, it might be silly but there's silliness in star wars there's silliness in harry potter these are fantasy movies and my movie is a unique warm wonderful comedic film and it, it's a great fourth film and you don't have to like the franchise to like it can i ask you something jeremy yeah so what is the first indiana jones film 
<laughs> the first Indiana Jones film is Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> but Temple of the Doom takes place before Raiders. Yeah. So that's the yeah, first I, film, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, so I think, no, I it, think it, you're with me right now, Linus, that we both hate Evan right now. You know, and he might have he might have got I mean, his argument in on a technicality, but it, it's it it's accepted, really loathsome. It's, it's loathsome that he would first. do this. And by the way, I know we're not gonna win when it. I watched we're not gonna win a technicality Wars, argument here because it was accepted, but <laughs> the fourth movie is Rogue One, not not a new hope. This the fourth story is Rogue One. When I, hope. They when say that, Star but it's Wars, not the fourth I'm gonna story. I'm gonna start with I'm starting with a new hope. I'm not starting with Phantom Menace. Yeah. I think whenever most people watch Star Wars, they're gonna start with a new hope. So that's the first film you watch. Linus. Okay, hold up. I just want you to know, Evan, hold up. I just yeah. want you guys to know I did pause the clock for just a second. Um, you guys can continue to try and validate the argument that it doesn't count as a fourth movie if you would like, but I'm just putting this out there. It was accepted as an answer, so any argument you make in that is not going to count. We just wanted to yell at him for a second, but we know it was accepted. Okay, but all right. I also, wanna... <laughs> also, thing. Okay. you can't accept speaking the fourth film. You didn't accept X Men First Class for me, and because there was four films before that in the franchise, but um, uh, the New Hope is accepted. Because uh, it, it is it is labeled as episode four by the studio. So it is there are that's the problem with Star Wars is there are multiple f- issues with it. Also, technically speaking, best fourth film in a franchise, first class was not even the fourth film made in the franchise. That's why it was not accepted. All right. Yeah, well, okay. Just to put that, okay. Time back on. Okay. Continuing from that point. Okay, the best fourth film in a franchise. Okay, we accept that. Well, one, two, and three then are the prequels. So uh, the the four, episode four, there's a lot of stuff that doesn't connect between episode four and the prequels. Like there's a lot of like re- yeah, things it's that weird. Like, just don't add up at all. And that and you're gonna say, oh, I sat through three wait. horrible, terrible movies, and now I'm gonna watch this one that really doesn't connect and re- and everything is retconned. Darth Vader's it's different weird in that movie and it doesn't too. fit together and like, it doesn't. They don't work. use him. The main I'll character wait. in the first three is barely used in the fourth one. That's kind of weird. And like you start wait. with all new characters out of nowhere. It's kind of strange. And oh wait, but with Star and, Trek: The Search for Spock. I gotta say, it's kind of forgettable to non-Star Trek fans. I honestly, when you say the search for oh. whales to a lot of people, hey, you like the Star Trek whales movie? I don't think many people are gonna know what you're talking the about. Most, <laughs> the most, the most forgettable Harry Potter that movie is, is Goblet of Fire. Goblet of Fire was directed by Mike Newell. This is a guy who is a one-off director. He he doesn't have the style that Alfonso Cuarón had before him. He doesn't have the style that David Yates had after. This is but the movie that is film. a great book. It doesn't wasn't well executed. Vol- Voldemort comes in at the end, and he does not uh, have the power that I hope he would have. He's it's great memorable. later on in the series, but Ray Fiennes had not found his voice, and it's not that memorable. It's it dissatisfying, is. and you have. I all think of people this remember the one with the games stuff. a lot more than the other films. And all right, with I'm gonna, I'm gonna take my chance here to speak. Stuff that happens in in i'm sorry one more thing well all this cataclysmic stuff that happens supposedly in the movie is underdone when at the end of your movie they're like oh that was a fun year now we're gonna have a new year next year and it's like i thought it was the end of the world and voldemort was back the movie's a mess the implications continue on and i think that's one of the best performances daniel radcliffe gives is in the fourth film it continues the franchise on in an amazing way where like star trek search for spock it's it awesome the franchise on more, but it's great a performances. Sh- Leonard Nimoy is so great, so funny. Okay, but here we go. I don't think Here's it's talked about that much. It's a problem. Look, it's look. It, th- th- that Star Trek movie is completely forgettable. The only thing that people remember is from Space Whales, and that is a very that's depressing. Joke. That's about your about that's, that's your opinion. Space whales. I it's know. No. I know a lot of of. Because I know like you know a lot of Star Trek people that have seen that movie. That's the one they remember. That's the one that they enjoy. Of all the Star Trek movies, that's the one that they enjoy. That's the one that brought a lot of people into Star Trek because it was this like TV, the cheesy thing. And then they saw this funny, exciting movie and it brought them into the fold. That it is a memorable movie for a lot of people. You may not remember it, but it is, it, for a lot of people, it is. Like- and the, the, to look at just to take A New Hope, A New Hope, it's, it's uh, the dialogue it really isn't there yet. When we think of the great character relationships, we think of the dialogue, we think of later movies, Empire Strikes Back. It's, it's George Lucas, the, a lot of it is just kind of canned. It, does, it hadn't quite come together yet. The connections and the relationships between the characters in my movie is so much stronger, so much, hu- so much more human and so much more connected than in A New Hope, which, yeah, it was this big, you know, blockbuster movie, but it was the later Star Wars movies that really were great. And the foot you 
want to say fourth movie, maybe I'll say fourth, fourth, uh, Force Awakens. That's a movie where uh, they were building on stuff, and it felt like a continuation. A New Hope. It, 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 there's just a it's, lot there that doesn't quite hold up in the way that my movie does. A lot of the relationships in A New Hope are strange too. Like you could tell that they didn't know exactly where they were going with the film. And I think having a fourth film in a franchise, it's very important to know the direction. And I think Goblet of Fire does that best out of all the films here. It knows the direction of where the franchise is coming. Yes, it has books based off it, but it applies that books well. It applies the character arcs and the performances as well. Well, it also, no hope. Sorry, it just kind of ends, and there, you don't even know if there's going to... If you didn't have Empire Strikes Back, it would have been fine, because there's not really that many unanswered questions. It's wrapped up well, so it doesn't even t- need a continuation. So having a, as the fourth film to continue a franchise... I don't know if it does that justice well. Okay. And Goblet um, of Fire I, also pisses me off because the characters are fighting and not getting along for much of it. Ron is an asshole in that movie. That's what and happens. It's not the They're one that, teenagers. It's not the one that they me when, I, when I enjoy life. those films. All right. All right. Okay. All right. Linus, you started this round, so you're going to go ahead and go first for closing. The relationship scene in Goblet of Fire is true relationships that you see of his teenage years. Harry Potter grows up in that film more so than he does in any of that. The development that he has, being in the games, being looked upon against his ass against the staff, everyone hating him because he got in the game even though he wasn't supposed to. He's looked down upon. But he defies those odds and does amazing work in the game. Yes, he has bad... Maybe the characters fight a lot but that's life that's teenagers i can tell you as a teenager myself that stuff kind of ha- happens and you have different relationships but the mysteries the quest it's such a fun film that continues the franchise well with star, star trek i don't know if your film does that well where it continues well and it's only really remembered about one thing that it does and taking it with the space whales which it's a great moment it's a great part of the film but that's like all that it's remembered for harry potter the gobbler fire does amazing things it Con- it drives Harry's character more so than any other film does. It continues the franchise and it lays the groundwork with the ending with Voldemort. And the character is maybe not in its best performance because Voldemort is just coming into himself in that scene. He's just kind of getting back to his form. With Star Wars A New Hope, which is fourth film, I guess, as the fourth film, it doesn't connect the universe as well. It doesn't apply to the franchise well. And it kind of feels like that they kind of lost what they were doing with the fourth film, and it doesn't connect well. Where all the other films connect better with each other, well, New Hope's kind of just out there. The relationships are not really connected as well, and the storylines just kind of end, and it doesn't really leave continuation, which my film does. Being in a franchise, being the fourth film, the fourth film continuing to be great, continuing to have great development and great scenes shows amazing work from The God of the Fire. All right, and Evan, you're up next. Go ahead. <sighs> okay. I'm finally getting a chance to speak. <laughs> this is taking way too long. Uh, and I'm going to be asking for an extended amount of time here. Um, I'm, I think, I'm, I'm going to take, I'm gonna take my time here. Um, I don't think you can yeah. now, can he? Oh, just from the speech. That's, never mind, sorry. Yeah, I mean, technically, we don't yeah. time closing arguments. Yeah, but sorry. Base it is, my bad, my you- bad. Goblet of Fire is probably one of the most laughed at movies in the Harry Potter franchise. It's one of the worst written. And you said, oh, you know, he's going through his teenage years. If you want to look at that and him actually having a character arc, watch Half-Blood Prince or watch Order of the Phoenix. That's when he actually grows the most as a character. Or even Prisoner of Azkaban. Goblet of Fire, you know, he just grew his hair and he looks a bit more scrappy there. Like, that's it. Goblet of Fire did nothing. Nothing for a story. If anything, it detracted from it. I already know that one's out of the contention. Jeremy, 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 Jeremy. Here, look, <laughs> I have I have had Robert Meyer Burnett, a Star Trek expert, come up to me and tell me that this is the worst Star Trek film in the OT. Now, look, I know you're movie geek yourself, but you know Robert Meyer Burnett. And whenever you have an expert telling you things, you trust them and you believe them. And I'm going to have to run with it. And also, Scott, Mance, Scott Mance loves it. He's an expert he loves too. It, but it's not his favorite. Look, this Voyager gets shadowed over by... Um, by by the first Star Trek and also by Wrath of Khan, two movies that overshadow um, the the first the um, the Voyager, and then also you called it fun at one point. I'm like, okay, yeah, a movie can be fun, but does it really make it great? No, it doesn't. A fun movie doesn't make something great. And you also said, yeah, there's no villain, and it you know they're celebrating that special cause. It's a political piece. Like Star Trek is known for doing politics, but it, it this one just kind of shoves it down your throat in a way it doesn't need to be done. And that's a shame for a Star Trek movie because it's smarter than that. 
and look, it's also, you could argue, it's one of the most forgotten about Star Trek movies. When you first said Voyager, I had to make sure I double-checked my research to make sure we were talking about the same movie here. And it, it's, just, it's just a shame that you had to pick this movie out of a bunch of other, you know, four movies. Now, let me let me jump into Star Wars New Hope. I was about to take a bunch of cheap shots about how it's one of the greatest films of all time, blah, blah, blah. And I was going to hold myself back, but then you guys didn't let me speak. So now I'm gonna about to go balls to the wall in Star Wars New Hope here. It has probably been one of the most regarded films that has ever changed the landscape of film. You know that, Jeremy. You cannot argue that. Um, the relationships that were built in, in that film is the only Star Wars movie to have an Oscar nomination in the role of acting with Alec Guinness. Um, and, and you know, you guys are arguing about tie-ins. It, it, it was a tie. It was a it was a jump in time. That's normal, especially when you try and tell different stories. That's normal. A jump in time. We picked up where our new characters were, Luke and Leia, and where they were in their lives. And and you can't debate that. And, and the the ways of the Force, lightsabers, Jedi, the impact that it has today is so important. Whenever you think about Star Wars Episode Four, New Hope, you can say, yeah, you know, Empire is better than this. But okay, sure, but. Okay, but that's like that's my point. Wrath of Khan is miles better than Voyager. Order of the Phoenix, uh, Deathly Hallows Part 1 and 2 is miles better than Goblet of Fire. Like, so that argument gets blown out of the water. And it's like, like I, my brain can't comprehend the idea that you are arguing that Star Wars Episode 4 is a bad movie and it doesn't tie in well. When, when it was made apparent in Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith, that George Lucas was trying his best to tie it into episode four. And that's something you can't argue. You know, they made the idea of uh, Darth Vader. And we only saw one thing of Darth Vader in episode, in episode three anyway. It was of him saying no. And that's why that's why we have this mystery in episode four. But who the heck is this dude? I just find it astonishing that you can sit here and argue that episode four isn't a good movie. When, when it's on the AFI Top 100 list, everybody says it got robbed in Oscar versus Annie Hall. And... I, it's just astonishing. And we also have one of the most iconic female characters of all time in Carrie Fisher. Rest in peace. All right, Jeremy, go ahead. All right, there's a lot I got to respond to there. Okay. Whoa, whoa, whoa. All well, right. You've had six minutes to talk. I did. All right. But I'm just going to say real quick then. <laughs> all right. You, you, every, people are just lobbying these these things that my movie it's it's forgotten it's not it, that movie is not forgotten if you love the star trek franchise uh, many people love this movie and i love this movie and and this is a movie that we need this is you might say oh it's just a political message no it's a great message it's a message that has something to say about who we are as people and that is what star trek is at its best star trek is a movie i'm sorry it's it's a franchise about people uh the best versions of ourselves, where what we can be in the future, what we can aspire to. And these are people that are, uh, they're on the, the outs from Starfleet. They're like criminals at that point. And yet they put themselves at risk to go back in time and save everything in this wonderful positive thing. And it's wonderful that there's no villain because we don't need it in this case. We need this, this story about people trying to do the best, trying to be the best. And the relationships between these characters, uh, Spock had died and they brought him back and in this movie he's still trying to figure out who he is and seeing him slowly remember who his friends are his rediscovering his connection with Kirk is so moving and the warm wonderful relationship that Kirk has with the scientist that he meets who's the the woman that he connects with it's so warm it's so funny it's a wonderful fun movie it's and it, it just means so much and a new hope it, it yeah it was a landmark movie but it just it doesn't really have it's just your standard kind of old school fable. He was rehashing, you know, the, the old Joseph Conrad story of the hero and doing it on this big, uh, big scale. And to me, it, when I watch that movie, it just doesn't resonate to me in the way that Empire Strikes Back does. It doesn't resonate to me in the way that the Voyage Home does. I watch the Voyage Home and I'm, I feel so connected to these great actors that played these characters for decades. And this is the most connected they ever were. This is the best message they ever have. And I think the movie is just as good as Wrath of Khan in a totally different way. Rather, you just throw it out there, Wrath of Khan's better. Why? Wrath of Khan's a good, good guy, bad guy, you know, fight in space movie. Voyage Home is a wonderful story about friendship, about love between people, about what we can be, what we can aspire to, and what we can mean. And Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, just a lot of it is, is just... 
uh, annoying character stuff with these characters that, you know, in the book, you could get into the characters and their psychology in the movie. They just kind of come off annoying. And Voldemort is a letdown. And it just it's it's the weakest, most I, I think that movie's way more forgettable than Voyage Home. Voyage Home is a memorable, moving, wonderful fourth film. And it, and it does what a what a fourth movie can do and what very few do. OK. And with that, we end the fifth round of this match. Um, I, I think that was really, really close. Um, just kind of going over the notes I took from your guys's. There was a lot of repeated points there. Yeah. Yeah, I try to avoid writing those down to make it easier on me. Um, okay, here's where I'm at. I think all three of you gave good enough defenses for your movie. Um, so once again, it comes down more about the attacks you put on the other films. Um... I think by far the most attacked out of these was Goblet of Fire. Yes. But I do think Linus did a good enough job defending them. And even though, and Jeremy did the same thing with this, even though you guys kind of both started out being a little jokey about your attacks against A New Hope, I think when Linus got the chance to speak, he actually did bring out some legitimate criticisms which Jeremy really didn't do. He more joked at the star, and he brought up the point of, uh, you know, it's a fourth film-ish, kind of, maybe. Um, but Linus did bring out some legitimate criticisms against it. He had to do the most defending on his movie, and he successfully did it in my eyes. I'm going to give him the point on this round for that one. Wow. Okay. That's a shocker. Well, I, I had some good attacks on A New Hope, but all right, fair enough. I thought I had good <laughs> attacks on The Irishman. Uh, defend, but that's how it goes sometimes. <laughs> All right. All right. So, with that, we're going to move into round number six. And this is the last one that Evan has chosen to sit out. So, once again, it's going to go back. It's going to go back to just two players on this one. Uh, and question number six is what is the best Quentin Tarantino movie? And we are going to start with Jeremy on this one. What is the best Quentin Tarantino movie? Go ahead. I believe the best Quentin Tarantino movie is Inglorious Bastards. This is a movie that does and says everything that really encapsulates Tarantino as a filmmaker. This is a movie that has individually awesome, great sequences of dialogue. The single best dialogue sequence ever in any Tarantino movie is the opening sequence of Inglorious Bastards with Hans Landa in the farmhouse. And this is a movie that has a lot to say about film. It is the movie in which film actually destroys the bad guys the most evil bad guys imaginable hitler film itself kills these guys and that is articulated in such an amazing uh, act of filmmaking the whole uh, the way everything sets up to the theater and what happens in the theater and uh the filmmaking involved is so spectacular the message is so tarantino and it's just got all the harm all the hard marks that you want from him it's got uh, a lot of referencing spaghetti westerns, referencing war movies, all the stuff that he does, referencing all the other films, is done just perfectly in this wonderful, unique balance that he had built to over all the movies that he made before. He just hit it all perfectly in this movie, and it has my favorite characters. It has Shoshana, who is the greatest heroine, I think, the greatest really hero, I would say even over the bride of a Tarantino movie. The way that she's been part of this horrible time in history and the way that she fights back when she really has nothing to fight back with she remakes herself she does amazing heroic things and you have uh, awesome characters all around you have a whole, totally different vibe with brad pitt and the bastards that work so well it gives such a, a counterpoint that it, it just fits in so awesomely and then the villain i mean hans landa is just one of the all-time great movie villains and this movie fires on every level sometimes you know earlier tarantino movies don't quite fire i don't think he had quite got it all together yet in the way that he does in inglorious bastards and it's fantastic and it has so much to say and 
it, it, it's just an amazing movie and just everything. The final line of the movie, the, the, the individual scenes, Michael Fassbender, the bar sequence, that bar sequence and the opening speech scene alone are just, they stand out in film history. I think this movie is really going to live on in a way that few movies do. I think it's that spectacular. It's Inglorious Bastards. Okay, and Linus, go ahead. So I'm arguing probably Quentin Tarantino's most famous movie, and I believe it's his most famous movie for a reason, because I believe it's his best movie, and that is Pulp Fiction. Pulp Fiction does something that hasn't really been done before, and it's kind of four mini-movies in one, which is one of the most riskiest things you can do, but it's executed fantastically. I love stories told in a chronological order, and this is probably the movie that does it in the best way possible. Even the opening scene, which, uh, it's just amazing what they do with Honey Bun and just setting up the characters. The characters in this film, I think, are some of the best characters Quentin Tarantino has ever written in just the exact moments. This film has an action movie in it. It has a romantic comedy kind of in it. It has just a raunchy comedy in it. It has all these parts in it that make it a fantastic film and is the definition of pretty much a Quentin Tarantino movie. And this is probably one of the most rewatchable films in history, in my opinion. I can just sit and rewatch this all the time. And what he does with directing this film, being a second film, taking all these characters as character actors, doing hilarious things that shouldn't work, like having Christopher Walken do a monologue about how he has a wash up his ass, and having that be development towards another character is something that's fantastic. And done in this amazing setting, in this amazing world he builds, this amazing characters he builds, the amazing intensity, genres, all wrapped up into one fantastically crafted film. All right, and with that, five minutes on the clock, time starts when you begin speaking. All right, in Pulp Fiction, Tarantino was a young filmmaker that was a, it thrown a lot out there. He was experimenting, and it made a big splash at the time. But there is stuff in that movie that is of a young filmmaker that doesn't work. There's the Fabian character who's annoying. There are scenes that, like, with, there are scenes that just the black comedy is a little off-putting. It doesn't all hold together for me. Whereas you see him as a more mature filmmaker in Inglorious Bastards. Everything connects. Everything works. Every scene of that movie fires in a way that is is only that movie does in terms of Tarantino there's always some shaggy stuff in Tarantino and everything is so solid and works together so well and there's just the, the individual characters in Pulp Fiction it just it, the, yes it was innovative but it, it is not him at firing on all cylinders yet I could see that argument but I think Pulp Fiction is the true essence of what a Quentin Tarantino film is it's his true what he would do with a film with it's an independent film he didn't have much of a studio behind it and what he did with the characters with the black comedy you said which might not exactly hold up but i think did amazing in the film and works fantastically in the parts of the film that it's in and i think pulp fiction just develops a bit stronger characters where inglorious bastards i think has amazing performances and the performances might be stronger than pulp fiction but pulp fiction is such an original story that he does with these two hitmen with the whole butch character with everything he does it's such an original movie where inglorious bastards is an original movie yes but it also has some elements from other films that i've seen before and it is executed amazingly well but pulp fiction is still remembered as the quentin tarantino film as these amazing moments that shouldn't work like quentin tarantino's ca uh, cameo of him yelling about coffee that should not work but it does all this Ter he's stuff terrible in that movie work, but it does <laughs> The Tarantino scene. He's terrible, but it works. Is, is so it bad. works. It, it does. His terribleness works. It, it, it really it's brings the movie better, down. Huh? And, and it's not the essence of Tarantino because this is a guy who's just, okay, I want to do something new. I want to tell a story. But he hadn't really found his voice yet. When you get to Inglorious Bastards, there's so much that he wants to say he has about. A voice, about but... There, there, there's so much that he wants to say about good, about evil, about how people can overcome an adversity, most of all about cinema. What, what, is gonna, what could have saved the war? What could have changed the war? And to Tarantino, it's the thing that he loves more than anything. It's cinema itself. And there's such a, such a powerful thing coming from him. This guy lives and breathes movies, and this is the movie in which the history is saved by cinema. And uh, the Pulp Fiction, it just doesn't resonate on that level. And I think it has 
Inglorious Bastards has better characters. Uh, Diane Kruger is fantastic in the scenes that she's in. Um, like I said, uh, uh, Michael Fassbender is such a wonderful, tragic character. And it was the, really when I discovered him as an actor, just thrown in there. There's so much in this movie. And there's just, I mean, you got Michael Fassbender or you got Tarantino in a terrible performance that almost kills uh, it works that it's Tarant terrible, Keitel. Though. It doesn't work I mean, in the way that Inglorious Bastards works in every it's scene. It's supposed to be terrible. And you've got, you know, you've got Marcellus Wallace, who's a, a one note kind of villain running through but it this works. thing. I've, I, it, it works, works but not, in not in the way that Christoph Waltz as Hans Landa works. Now, that's a yes, villain that is running a better through villain, a story. I'll admit that. But he's not the main focus of the story. If he was more of a main focus than he was. He's that a better type. villain than Marcellus Wallace. Shoshana is a better character than any of your leads that we resonate with. Uh, they're funny, great dialogue with Brad Pitt and those characters that I think did something unique in a way that, yeah, your movie, you're saying it's this innovative thing, but it was looking back to other independent cinema that came before it. He was building on things from still Reservoir Dogs. Stuff that he did in Reservoir Dogs, he was doing again. He did it, it better. Not, yeah, he did it better, but it's not, it, it's not innovative in the way that what he did with the characters in my movie, with the history of it, with all old movies looking to, he did it in a, in a way that fired more. Your movie is looking yes. back at film noir and this other stuff, and it just doesn't have the resonance. It doesn't but have the it, power it or the innovation. Cinema. And it is still such a classic movie. There's so many quotable lines. Whereas in Glorious Bastards, I can maybe quote a couple lines. I can almost quote the whole movie. Your, your movie fiction. came Some at the right time. Also quote your movie, movie came at the right time. It grabbed people's attention and it was innovative. But my movie is a better movie from beginning to end. We're not arguing what was the most innovative or interesting Tarantino movie that made a splash when it came out. We're arguing the best Tarantino movie. And from scene to scene, every directorial choice, every performance, every theme and message in that movie makes it the best Tarantino movie. And there are things you've conceded yourself there are things in Pulp Fiction that don't work you've conceded like, like the that stuff works there's better terrible than characters overall. that there are characters in that movie that just don't fit that bring it down and the pace it, it it the pacing is just not as good like yeah it was interesting to have these different scenes and do it out of context but some of those scenes are paced better than others whereas okay, the way okay, my movies inter interlinked is flawless time all right all right with that we're gonna go ahead and go to final statements Jeremy you're first yeah, it's the best. What is the best Quentin Tarantino movie? This is a movie that Tarantino got to say what what he really believes in, in terms of what is good, what is evil. Well, what you know, he got to say, tell this story, this really human story of this this woman who everything was destroyed in her life and she got to commit an, an act of revenge. But that act of revenge had love in it. It had it had some sense of hope in it and it was also an act of art art in terms of her running putting a making a movie killing the the nazis with a movie this was something really special that came right out of tarantino's heart and the movie like every sequence works the bar sequence is just the the way suspense builds in that is like nothing in any other movie and it it is the best tarantino movie pulp fiction it, it made a splash it did some things well it did some other things not as well but as a work of art and as an expression of who tarantino is and what he wants to say to us and what's he, what he wants to give to us as an audience, nothing beats Inglorious Bastards. And I think it could possibly be the best film of this millennium so far. And Linus, go ahead. It's your mic. We cannot hear you. Can you hear me? No. I can hear you now. Okay. I don't know what that was. Sorry. All right. So I am going to agree with you that Inglorious Bastard is a fantastic film for what he does with it. But I do think he plays it a little safe in some aspects where Pulp Fiction was probably one of the biggest risks in cinematic history, taking pretty much the end of the movie and putting it in the front of the movie and showing you how it happened in such a different way and showing you things that you probably don't need to see, but seeing it makes the film better in all that way. Some of the characters in Pulp Fiction are going to be way more memorable than the characters in Glorious Bastards, even though the performances in Glorious Bastards are utterly fantastic and is a great film. But I think in Glorious Bastards does have some slow moments to it where you kind of drift off and you want to get back to the action part of it. Well, Pulp Fiction, every scene is important and every scene matters to the film overall. 
they all have great moments. They're both fantastic films, but I think Pulp Fiction is the overall better film as it is more remembered. It is better paced, and it is overall packaged as something amazing that we've not seen before, seeing all these genres blended together and being such this risk that was taken, such these characters' moves, all these scenes that shouldn't work, that are proven to work, where your film, it's a bit of an easier film to make, him to make, being more mature, he had more of a budget, but this independent style he did making this film was just fantastic for what he did with it. Okay, and with that, we are at the end of round six. Uh, another good round for both of you guys, but this one's a little bit easier for me. This one is going to go to Jeremy simply because he got more hits off against Pulp Fiction than Linus was able to against Inglorious Bastards. And it's as simple as that. All Linus really got off against Inglorious Bastards is it's not as quotable as Pulp Fiction, which I don't know is the most legitimate criticism because quotability is something that's by person by person. And he did say that they also uh, play it safe in some areas, which Jeremy didn't argue back against. But Jeremy definitely got more off against Linus in that round. So it's going to go to Jeremy on that one. Good job, Linus. All right. And with that, we're going to move into round seven. We do have two rounds left. Um, and the score, is currently, the score is currently three to Jeremy, one to Linus, and two to Evan. So, Jeremy, as of now... You are through to the speed round. You are through to the end of this match, at least. Okay. Uh, any point you earn from here on out is just bonus points adding to your lead. No. Evan, if you get the next point, you also move into the speed round, and we'll, the final match will just be played for points on stats. Linus, you need to get this. Uh, you either need to not have Evan win, or you need to win the next round in order to stay in the match and possibly go to the speed round. Okay. And with that, we are going to go ahead and move into question number seven. Um, yeah, okay. We're going to go ahead and go into question number seven. And the question is, what was the most successful movie, in your opinion, of 2017? Now, there was no uh, marginal line for what someone could call successful, you're, you can argue success in whichever way you like. You just have to have the most convincing argument for what was the most successful film of 2017. With that, Linus is going to be going first on this question. Um, Linus, you can go ahead and begin your opening statements. Okay. So this is a subjective question for sure. I'm sure we're all going to have different arguments for this film. But I'm going to take my argument the way I want to take it, and that is for Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri as the most successful film of 2017. Now, box office success, you could this film did not win. But I think praise success and accomplishing what the film was supposed to do and ha handling an important subject matter like it does, brilliantly like it does, and just being an overall amazing movie and a successfully fantastic movie this year, is that why it is the most successful film was 2017. This film portrays the emotion of anger. That is what the main thing of the movie is. It's, uh, it's a film about the uh, death of a daughter and a mother trying to deal with it and anger and rage, what that does to a person, backdropped by this, hor this town's police department and blaming it on other people. And anger is represented so well in this film and it's almost subtle that you don't realize that it's the theme of the film towards the end of it when you hear woody harrelson's letter to dixon and how anger kind of took over his life but towards the end the character arcs and development from the characters overall is one of the most successful things i've seen in cinema in the longest time and this is a film that i probably will consider a modern masterpiece i think it was fantastic and as a successful film being the greatest film and the awards acclaim it has already gotten it has won the majority of the awards at the SAG Awards. It has won the Golden Globe Award for Best Drama. It has won acting awards for Francis McDormand and for um, Sam Rockwell, deservedly. And it just portrays Anger well, who is someone who probably used to deal with Anger a little well. Seeing it portrayed in this film the way it is is fantastic. All right, Evan, you're up next. Go ahead. Successful means so many different things. It means 
how well was it made it means the box office of it, it means the cult following it has it, it means how trendy is the film <laughs> you really break it down um what a lot of people are saying is the the highest successful box office movie this year is get out as in terms of uh profit margins it has the highest percentage of profit made uh so that's knock for get out get out was nominated for four oscars um considering best director best actor best picture and also you know what um best screenplay so there's that. It isn't a critically acclaimed film. And it's probably the most memed film of the year. The whole Get Out Challenge thing uh, went viral. That's part of success. The whole idea of being in the sunken place, that was a success. Um, the whole idea of the sunken place and people and, and, and everyone saying, yeah, white people are crazy. That's part of success. It's probably the most talks about film of the year. And it's probably the most cultural impact of uh, it, the, it, it is the most culturally impactful movie of the year. And I don't think you can argue that at all because it has gotten to the most eyes and it is something that has been praised by many. It is, it is a film that I think will is starting to allow for more. Um, black people to be involved in cinema and to be involved in culture as this has been said it says uh, a lot of people have claimed Jordan Peele to be the first time out of the gate director to direct a movie like this is insane and to write a movie like this as he came from comedy to write a crazy suspense social commentary movie just like this like get out just on all basis of what someone would call successful completely carries that through and yeah all right, and Jeremy, go ahead. All right, I, I will argue success as being the different ways in which a movie can can really succeed and rise to heights on multitude of different levels. Um, and so I'm picking my hands down favorite movie of the year, the movie that actually moved me, changed the way that I think about movies, touched me in a way that no other movie did this year. And that is Guillermo del Toro's The Shape of Water. Now, this movie is successful in so many different ways. It's successful in that it's a very low budget movie. It was made on 20, I believe a budget of 20 million. And it looks like this amazing, uh, great, uh, a big, huge budget movie with these awesome sets, visual effects. It's, it, it's a period piece. How they did this on this budget, I don't know, but the movie looks great. And it, it just, everything about it feels big and epic. But at the same time, it, were, it is successful as a human story, as a drama. To me, it moved me more than any other movie this year. It had uh, an unbelievable performance by, uh, by the lead actress, Sally Hawkins, who plays a woman who's mute, who is, lives in, uh, I believe it's 1960, who just feels like she doesn't belong in the time. And uh, she doesn't know where her life is going. She can't talk. She can't express herself. And just the way that she gives this performance without words is so amazing. Richard Jenkins plays her friend who, and, uh, who lives near her, who is a gay man living in this time. And it is such a great performance. And then it's also a great, it, it succeeds as all kind of a, a monster movie. It's they, it, it has the sea creature, this the creature from the Lac Lagoon. And Guillermo del Toro is somebody that loves monster movies. It's his passion. He's expressed that in most of his films, and this is the ultimate expression of that. And he succeeds in telling this throwback sort of monster movie, uh, just that in itself, better than any other movie that he did, and really better than most movies that I've seen. It's it's fantastic. It's scary at times. Uh, you believe you love the monster. You get to connect with him in a way, which is something great about a lot of monster movies like King Kong. It does that. And it also succeeds as a good versus evil. It's got a great villain played by Michael Shannon, who's just a, a, a scary, fantastic villain. But at the same time, he would have been the hero in movies of that time, which is such a great comment. He would have been the good guy, the G-man. And we see him at home. His family loves him. Everyone looks up to him, but he's rotten inside. He's the true monster. There's so much this movie succeeds at. And if you're going to talk about Oscars, it had the most Oscar nominations of these movies this year, uh, a really high number. Um, and it's a fantastic movie and for me it, it is the movie that succeeds it's my favorite movie of the year and Guillermo del Toro is a genius all right and with that it's going to be six minutes on the clock when the first one of you begins speaking dude okay here's the issue and, and I, I think you need to be able to see this um you talk about um 
in the shape of water is good versus evil. That's a very simple thing. Get Out is much more detailed in, in, in its way how it's built. Its structure is black versus white. We the movies in, in studios don't even touch these kind of things because it's so touchy. And you also say, yeah, it, it was successful as and it was only a twenty million dollar movie. Uh, sorry, uh, a yeah, a twenty million dollar movie. Get Out was four million dollars. This movie is made on four million dollars, and the and what they do with the sunken place, and what they do with the, the with the shots, and how it's set up at a mansion. That the way how the way how Jordan Peele made independent filmmaking look like it was a big budget kind of studio, a forty million dollar movie is just insane to me, and it blows my eyes. I got to talk about three billboards out of, out of Ebby, Missouri, really fast. I, look, success is defined by many things. The issue, the, the main issue with is, uh, three billboards out of Ebby, Missouri, is nobody talks about it. Nobody talks about no, it at who, all. Who are you listening to? Everyone talks about it. It's one <laughs> most of the film awards. Audience. It's the most awarded film. The common film, film of audience the people do not talk about three billboards out of Ebbing, Missouri. Do they talk about Shape of Water? Sure. Do they talk about Get Out? Yes, sir, they do. But they do not talk about three billboards out of Ebbing, Missouri because this is one is one of those films that, are, that is very overlooked, meaning is not successful by any means of the imagination. I think it winning awards in multiple award shows shows that it's successful in and of itself. It's successful of what it's trying to do. I think the themes of Three Bull Builds Outside of Ebbing, Missouri is very impactful and risky too with going against the cops the way they did, especially with the riots we've had against police not helping people. It is insane. It is great to see it represented on film. With The Shape of Water, I got to say, there's some elements of that film that I don't think works completely, like the whole Russian spy film. Russians like the spy for the Russian. I don't know if that works completely in it. Those scenes feel a little off. Even sometimes Michael Shannon's character seems like he's acting very differently and sort of even in a different film at some points, in my opinion at least. With Three Billboards Outside of Ebbing, Missouri, every part of that film works amazingly. It is the most award winner of this year. And maybe Joe on the street's not talking about it, but any movie fan is going to be talking about Three Billboards Out. Side Ebbing, Missouri is one of the fantastic films. With Get Out, I gotta say, it's very successful this year for what it's doing, but I feel when I look back at 2017, I'm gonna look at Three Billboards the more so. And Jordan Peele, I think, is gonna have more successful films later on, and that's what I'm gonna look for as success from him, where Get Out was a great starter for him. I'd love for you to tell me why. All right, right, what I'm gonna say (laughs) about Get Out is you you, you said that Get Out took a $4 million budget and and it did this amazing big movie with it. It looks like an independent movie. There there are some moments that are well Mm -hmm. done, but it doesn't, the Shape of Water took a low budget and the detail, the visuals, the special effects, the sets, everything, the art direction, the costumes, this is a big movie. It's a miraculous what they did with this movie. You can't even compare what they did on this one uh, location in Get Out. It takes place basically in one location. It feels like an indie movie. And if you're talking about success, okay, maybe Get Out is successful as a statement. It's a, it's a statement. It has a message. But as a thriller, it does, it does not as successful. It's, it's got a lot of jump scares. It's stuff that I've seen before. Shape exactly. of Water as, as a monster movie, as a thriller, is completely uh, it, it's thrilling and exciting. It works on so many different levels. Get yeah. Out. The characters are one note. They got good, they got exactly. good actors, the monster, but the characters are the one problem. note, whereas the it's characters are layered the in monster. The Shape of Water. No, I here's it's, it's not thrilling because of the monster, and I think that's what you're missing. And Get Out might not be thrilling to you. You care. But, but it you, is thrilling to many. It's thrilling to many of my black you friends. Care, you care about the monster. The monster, the monster. The monster is, is still scene, a monster, seems. but no, but he's a monster that has Shannon. human it's dimension. Really and you grow to care about him. The monster is not important in the film at all. He's like. Yeah, he does. No development. He, he's just the monster, he, good guy. No, he, weird. he, he, like, he, the, the wonderful, no like, Guillermo del Toro moment where he eats the cat and then he feels bad about it. The way that he connects to yeah, this that's, woman that's who can't thing. talk because he can't talk either. This is a character. And Doug Jones is, who I talked about earlier, her Doug Jones' never really per- physical his perspective performance that often. is amazing and extraordinary. There's nothing on this level of artistry in either of your movies. And I just want to say real quick, Three Billboards, I didn't get it. That movie is so overrated. It it purports to be this realistic story about these angry people and stuff but it's the most unrealistic movie i've seen there's a scene where a character takes like a molotov cocktail destroys a police station gets away with it that she's the key suspect she's never prosecuted it's ridiculous it's got a scene where a guy a cop throws a guy out of a window and he just loses his job he isn't even like prosecuted those moments took me it's out the, the town they're one, in. the, the movie is one of note. the missouri the township movie the plays the same are... note and the movie has this ending where it's supposed to be this dark like it's oh 
fantastic. Human, this dark side of humanity. But there's so much in the movie that's unrealistic that it clashed with itself. The tones clash and it never it never worked. Shape of Water, Michael Shannon, he is this he is this complex guy. He is a guy who wants to do the right thing, but you can see the, exactly what you can see sometimes. how he's rotted inside and it and it's such a fantastic performance and it fits in with with this bigger movie. It, everything works in the Shape of Water and works together. Here's the thing. I think Shape of Water came out in the exactly wrong time. It came out and here's why it's not successful. It came out in a time where people don't want to see a movie like this. People don't want to see a, a girl fall in love with a beast. You know, people are making bestiality jokes about it, which look, whether you agree with them or not, but the fact that people are making jokes about We've seen that, the story before, yeah. yeah we've seen the story also. before many times. And that's your, that's the thing. It's yours the thing. is an escape, an escape from the people that want to kill me movie. Yours is an a Cohen Brothers no, wanna be wannabe movie. Their movie is like secondhand Cohen Brothers. You can't no, tell me shape of movie is uh, shape of water isn't new and your no, movies Jimmy. are. You're insane for thinking that. Get Out is not an escape from the people that want to kill me movie. Get Out is a movie where, where the people... He's where, literally where hitting play. people okay, on the head has a good theme, and basic knocking press. them Fine. out, and there's jump scares. All right. Okay. All right. Closing arguments. Uh, Linus, you're up first. Go ahead. When we were talking about actual success for a movie, I think the most success a movie can get is awards recognition. And so far, Three Billboards is the most awards recognition film. Shape of Water is good, but I don't even know successful film of 17. Being 2017, I don't know if that's the film we really needed of this year. If this was, say, a 2009 film, yeah, sure, we might remember that as an amazing film from 2009. But 2017, this film doesn't really, it doesn't really apply to a lot of stuff going on where... Three Billboards does and Evans Film Get Out does, but I think Get Out is a theme kind of masked, is a sort of a basic plot masked over a great theme. And the basic plot of the film doesn't work exactly where Three Billboards is a theme masked over a fantastic film. And it does work. The ending does work because it shows people are human and they're on the car and they're like, are we going to do it? I don't know. Let's figure it out on the way. That is the most perfect ending you could have had to a film like that. And the, it is realistic because this guy is never caught. And it's realistic because you see all this parts to it and anger. And sure, some of this stuff is realistic, is unrealistic, but it's a movie. <laughs> uh, I know not all movies are supposed to be realistic. If movies were all realistic, they wouldn't be very interesting. So you have to add this element to it. The successfulness of Three Billboards is not going to be forgotten. Is because when I think of 2017, personally, I'm going to think of this movie as my favorite movie. Shape of Water a couple years you asked me when it come, came out, I don't know if I'm going to be able to tell you 2017. Get Out, I think I'm, it's going to be forgotten by Jordan Peele's other amazing work that he'll do later on in his career. Three Billboards is the most successful for those reasons. All right, Evan, go ahead. Linus, 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 Linus. Oh, you're so funny. You go, you know, uh, you know you're, you're banking too much on the future of Jordan Peele's career overshadowing something like Get Out. We're not sure about Jordan Peele's future, so how are we sure if something's gonna overshadow it? And like, it's exactly if you're banking on his career, that means it all started at Get Out. So that argument just is kind of unproportional. And, and you know, and you keep talking about award shows and successes. I'm gonna bring this up in a time where things are changing, and, and, and you know, and things are becoming more revolutionary in, in the terms of Oscar movies. There's nothing really revolutionary about about three build me uh three billboards of evie missouri sorry if i'm gonna be blunt here but it's just another movie um you know it, it's it's another oscar bait movie uh filled with this is gonna sound blunt but white people that you know where you know does that story work it if you replace it with it with with a black cast i don't know um and i think that's important to include there especially as we're progressing as a society which i think get out does so well and so marvelously we have a we have a movie in, in february coming out called black panther I think Get Out is the perfect movie of 2007 to come out before Black Panther because it's warming up the idea to audiences that, yes, black people can be in these movies. And it, it it's very important. It's one of the – it's I would argue it's the most memed movie of the year, so it's probably one of the – I would say it's the most trendy movie of the year. Everybody talks about Get Out, like how they talked about uh, American Sniper uh, in 2014. I hope that's right. Um, and you know, to, 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 to stack, just put it onto the facts here – it is the most it has it is it has made the most profit out of the other movies here shape of water has barely broken even if you think about marketing and how much the uh, movie theaters take out i did some quick math there and um it's just 
I, I, I feel desensitized to the fact that you guys are like, oh, yeah, Get Out's a simple plot. No, it's not. We've never seen the idea of a black man going to a white person's family and saying, you know, I would have voted for Obama. But then the whole idea and the big twist and out was such a thing that people talked about forever. We're in Shape of Water. I don't feel like people are going to be talking about it enough because it's there's something about movies being digestible to audiences and shape of water and three billboards aren't that and that's why it's not successful because it's not gonna be able to one make the box office be two as trendy well get awards yeah but that's because that's what those people want it's not successful to a wider audience well get out is both successful successful to a big global audience and also the critics as well all right and jeremy go ahead all right, to respond to Linus, uh, Shape of Water has had just as much uh, awards recognition as, uh, as his movie has. It's, not, it's nominated for an incredible amount of awards, technical achievements, and it, it, will, it is a lock, for my opinion, for Best Director and very likely for Best Picture because this is a great work of art. This is an artist expressing himself after all these other good movies that he's made. This is like the fullest expression of Guillermo del Toro, and it's a fan. it works on so many different levels. It's successful on so many different levels. Now, Get Out, you say it's this innovative movie. It's this, this groundbreaking movie. Jordan Peele himself has said it's the Stepford Wives. He calls it himself. He calls it the Stepford Blacks. It's the story of the Stepford Wives, women that were that reprogrammed by men to do their bidding. It's that same story used again. And if you take the racial themes out of the movie, like I said, you're left with one note characters. You're left with a, a goofy best friend. You're left with a hero who just really doesn't have much to his life other than he's got a girlfriend and and eventually he's got to try to get out of this location there isn't that much there and the thriller it isn't that thrilling it isn't that scary it's it, he hits people on the head to escape as a thriller it do, it just doesn't fully work and my movie fully works it's exciting it's got interesting cool scenes from beginning to end and the characters the characters in my movie which is a monster movie which is a, a fantasy are so much better than the characters in in ebbing missouri these are layered characters we get we could have a full movie of Richard Jenkins' character, he's layered. There are times we hate him. There are times we love him. The characters in Ebbing, Missouri are just, again, one note. They're just angry people. And the movie wants us to go, oh, this is life. Life is so tough. And, and we don't get easy answers. But it gives us easy answers when she destroys the police station. When, when these things happen uh, and it's like, oh, it's an action moment and all this stuff. And it, and it doesn't feel real. And then it takes us out. It's, it, it betrays that. And then at the end, it wants to be like, oh, it's so real. It's so true to life, but it portrays itself by not being realistic, by not being true to the to what can really happen and what's really realistic in life. My movie it finds a tone, it sticks to it, and the fact that he could do this film out of low budget with these visuals, with these performances, with these uh, values, and get as much awards recognition as it has, this is a successful movie. This is a movie for the ages, and a lot of people will remember this. People that love genre, people that love uh, great filmmaking, great visuals, great directors will always love shape of water all right and with that that is going to be the end of round seven here um just to rattle off a couple numbers here because you guys did talk a little bit about uh critical and box office success um as of now and these are just um the budgets are production budgets and the box office is just straight box office without accounting for any marketing and without accounting for the percentage that the theaters take away from the movie Right now, Shape of Water, uh, the budget was 19.5 million, and it's so far made 51.9 million. Ebbing, Missouri, cost 12 million and made 71.4 at the box office. And Get Out uh, was made on a budget of 4.5 and made 254.8 million. Also, in terms of critical reset, critical success, Get Out currently has a 99% on Rotten Tomatoes. Three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri, has a 93%, and Shape of Water has a 92%. Always with the preface of Rotten Tomatoes, it's not the end-all, be-all of critical success. It's just the easiest way to gauge it. And also, yes, Shape of Water does have 13 Oscar nominations, which is the second most ever behind the three movies that have had 14 nominations. I believe those are All About Eve, uh, I think Lord of the Rings, or no, Titanic or Lord of the Rings? Shit. Yeah, one of those. Or Ben-Hur, I'm not yeah, sure. One of, one of those, <laughs> and then Lala, Lala, Lala Land's the other one. Um, no. well, I did good there with fact-checking. Um, no. So, okay, so going into this, um, I 
Jeremy's the one that I'm actually going to have to pull out first on this fight. I think between Evan and Linus, they did get enough hits off against Shape of Water to deem it out of the fight. So then it becomes more down between Linus and Evan and the, the approach that they each took to deeming what is successful about their films. Evan took a very statistical and kind of mathematical approach to success. It has, out of I don't know, out of every movie in the year, although I believe it if it's a true fact, it has the highest success margin definitely out of these three films. It, does, it did garner Oscar nominations, which people may not have seen coming. Um, it was definitely very in the culture of this year, and it was a very talked about movie, and it did touch on some racial topics that not a lot of movies touch on very often. Linus took a more plot-based, passion approach to the argument, saying, in terms of just straight movie quality filmmaking, Three Billboards is the most successful film of the year, using um, the plot points from the film, discussing about how well it portrays the, the emotion of anger and through the characters of the film, and discussing the fact that it has won multiple awards and does have multiple Academy Award nominations going for it right now. Um, on that note... I'm going to give the point to Linus because Evan had more lashes. Like People hit against Get Out more than they did Three Billboards. So I'm going to give it to Linus on that front because his movie wasn't attacked as much and he was able to defend it when it was attacked. Um, but I definitely, again, that, that was definitely a, an interesting fight. And I do like the idea of looking at this question from different angles and seeing how it affects the fight and how you fight each, each other. Good. That was a good fight all around, guys. All right, guys, and with that, we are moving into the final question. So here's where everything's at. The score is three to two to two. If Linus or Evan wins this question, they will be moving into the final round, into the speed round against Jeremy. If Jeremy takes this question, that means Linus and Evan will have to face off in a speed round. Worth no points towards the match. It's just to determine which one of them moves into the final round. With that being said... This is a random ass question to have as the final question of the match, but uh, hey, why not? Let's fight it. What is the best movie centered around baseball? And Evan, you are going to be going first on this one. Go ahead. What is the best movie centered around baseball? Sandlot has to be the best movie um, around baseball. It has some of the most dynamic characters in it. It has great child acting. You never see that. The script is a straightforward top to bottom it has the best james earl jones performance out of the out of the two picked here and it, it has the most heart to it and it's the most quotable out of the three you you gotta be killing me smalls like w when you break down the other two films you know they're oscar Beatty films they're films that you know you know only adults would be able to appreciate this is this isn't a this is a film for all ages and I think that's important whenever you talk about this too. This film expands audiences. It is both culturally diverse and it is also um, something that adults look back on and like, yeah, I love this movie. And kids can enjoy at that very amount of time. And the whole the beast and, and Benny the Jet Rodriguez, the whole the whole concept and 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 how their relationships feed back into each other. This movie is a cultural milestone because anyone who doesn't know the sand law, everybody's in shock by. If I said, hey, do you know Field of Dreams? They're like, no, I wouldn't be shocked by that. If I, if I said, hey, do you know Moneyball? And they're like, no, I wouldn't be shocked by that. But if I said, hey, do you know the sand lot? And they said, no, I would be shocked and have to show it to them right then and right there because it's that culturally impacted. And, and everybody has seen this movie for good reason. Okay, Jeremy, you're up next. Go ahead. All right, I'm going to start in an unusual way by telling you about me and my dad. My dad and I are, for whatever reason, very different types of people. I, I, from a very early age, I was an artistic sort of person, and I never really liked sports. I wasn't into sports. I, I, I didn't watch sports. My dad is all about sports. His dream was to have a son that he could coach in a little league team, and he got two sons that were nerds instead. And my dad, there's always been a gulf between us when it came to sports and when it came to, to specifically baseball, which is my dad's favorite sport. But one day when I was 10 years old, this movie Field of Dreams came out, and I watched this movie with my dad. And as a young person discovering cinema, this movie changed my life. This is a wonderful throwback to the films of Frank Capra. It's a, fa it's a fantasy slash with the drama about a man 
who uh, has a farm and he hears a voice. The voice talks to him and says, if you build it, he will come. What is that? It's a mystery. It's fanciful. And you go to realize that he's being told to build this baseball field. He builds this baseball field. Um, he's, this voice tells him to do other things. He finds these other people. It's this journey that he's on. It's all really interesting. There's a lot of great humor along the way. You're engaged in this movie. And then ultimately what this movie is, is this voice. We ultimately spoilers guys. Sorry if you haven't seen it. We ultimately learn this voice is really himself telling himself if he builds this baseball field, his dad is going to come back. His dad, who he had a bad relationship with, kind of familiar for me. They didn't see eye to eye. And his dad comes back from the beyond as a young man. And he always saw his dad was old when he was born. So he always saw his dad as an old man. And his dad comes back at the end. He sees him as a young man. He connects to him in a way he never did before. And he says, Dad, do you want to have a catch? And, and the man seems to recognize that this is his son. He said, yes. And they have a catch together. And I watched this with my dad when I was 10 years old. And I felt connected because of baseball. He was connecting the baseball. I felt connected because of this great story with these great characters and this great message about fathers and sons. And I'll always carry this movie with me. And it always means something to me as a film about baseball, as a film about life, as a film about people. This is one of the most wonderful, inspiring, touching films. And few movies mean to me what Field of Dreams does. It's one of the all-time greats. And I, I'm just going to let you guys talk and I'll keep crying. <laughs> don't make it hard on us. All right. Minus, go ahead. Well, that that was fantastic, Jeremy. I don't know what else to say besides that, but that, that was fantastic. You can drop out Linus. Come on, Linus. Shit, it's on. Oh, All right. So, <laughs> but I, with you, am not the biggest sports fan or anything, but what the film I chose, Moneyball, does is it takes more than just the element of sports to the game. And uh, this film has amazing performances. It was the Best Picture nominee. Uh, written by Aaron Sorkin or co-written by Aaron Sorkin. It, it's based off this book and it's just, it shows, it tells the story about this struggling baseball team and how they take this gamble to get more successful by taking these more unknown players and just basing it off stats more so than how well they can throw a ball, which is a fantastic new idea brought into the genre of sports movies. And it is a baseball movie, yes, but it's shown a lot more. It's a drama with fantastic performances. Uh, you never thought Jonah Hill could do this Oscar-nominated worthy performance at the time this film came out. Brad Pitt is amazing. It is amazing. It is amazing score. It is amazing direction, writing, and it's just it makes baseball so interesting. When I'm not really interested in baseball in itself. All right, and with that. Um, for the sake of time, are you guys cool if I shorten this one by a minute? Yeah. Please okay. do. All right. <laughs> All right. So we'll we'll cut and start that. All right. Three, two, one. All right, guys. So good opening arguments for this one. We're going to go with five minutes on the clock just because we're kind of winding down. Uh, time starts when one of you begins speaking. Right. Money balls. So money balls to me. Moneyball to right? me is kind no, of perfunctory. It's just, all you're saying is this movie's interesting. It's a drama. It's this. It's that. Dude, come on. And and, that, and that's why that's why my film just exceeds yours because it's it's more than surface level. It, it's about a communal thing, as Jeremy would say. It's about relationships and 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 how this kid named Smalls could had trouble making friends until he got accepted into the thing. All of us know what it's like to not be accepted into something, and that's why so many people can relate to Sandlot is because they finally felt a part of something. And to base off of your story, Jeremy, it's it's very impactful, and I understand exactly where you're coming from. But I do have to say this about your argument really fast: you were, you were, you have been bashing realism, uh, not non realism, this whole time, and, and now the one time it, it's we we have some non realism in it, you tend to love it. It like you get what I'm saying there, dude. Well, my movie, this is a fantasy. This is a movie that's supposed to be larger than life. It begins with a guy hearing a voice from beyond, and it works on that level. Just like Shape of Water is a, is a wonderful, fantastical movie with fantastical things. A movie has to be what it is and has to work on that level. And to me, Moneyball is kind of perfunctory. It's, it's a business story. It's about a businessman trying to make good, and it, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't really connect in a really deep way. It just kind of goes through the motions. There are things in it that don't work. They, relate. they try to give you a little emotion with the relationship with him and his daughter. It never really connects. 
connects. And then uh, uh, Sandlot, if, yeah, there's a great coming of age movie that changed my life. It's called Stand By Me. This is a movie about yeah. young kids in that era uh, connecting and everything that they go through together. Sandlot, it's kind well, of really secondhand. Quick. It's Stand secondhand. Me. Sorry. For it's secondhand Stand, Stand By Me. It's, it's, it's disrespectful. It's secondhand Stand By Me. It's rehashing what we'd seen in better coming of age movies. The baseball really isn't that central to it. It's just kind of a device to have a it, lot of joke. Yeah. It's a jokey movie. It's very jokey. It's kiddie. It, it doesn't resonate really on a deep level in the way that coming of age movies does and the way that other baseball movies do. Okay, I think that movie here, is here's the, here, here's too the happy of an ending. Th also. This is what's frustrating me about that argument. If that was true, there not so many people would actually resonate with Sandlot. And more people have, have resonated with this. I know a lot of people never heard of it. Uh, <laughs> and the, it I know people that have seen it that don't remember space. it. That, that you you that have your perspective. Does it change mind. people's lives? I wouldn't no, say it, it doesn't change I never said it changes people's lives. lives. I never they all become that. like baseball players at the end. It's like it kind of wraps it up too easy. They're all super successful, and that's not it's true a at great all. Coming of age movie, but it has way too happy of an ending. Dude, no why? My... Don't, don't even get me started on your movie. As your movie is one of the most bland things I've ever seen. I've see, yeah, I've seen Moneyball. It's very bland. It's very pretty bland. I mean, is it the flashy? Say, pretty perfunctory. No, it's a fantastic You'll made movie about off. baseball. It does baseball well. Like, you know, my movie, you my movie is about. How do you know about... does baseball well if you haven't? If you don't enjoy baseball, how do you know something does baseball well if you say it yourself that you don't enjoy baseball? And I have to talk about Field of Dreams really quickly. The pacing in that movie is all over the place. We get some very exciting moments, and it's like, oh man, when is it? When are we gonna get through this scene? And there's some like actors and characters are just thrown in, like uh, Archie Moonlight, like that whole great idea. character, Sense. fantastic character. It, let it me let me talk about Burt Lancaster for a second. This was a man at the end of his career, one of the all-time great cinema legends. And who else are you going to bring in to to represent this this person who represents people that have loved baseball and wanted, but they had to choose a different path in life? And that connects with the decisions that Kevin Costner made in his life, the decisions that his dad had made, and Burt Lancaster is so warm and so wonderful let me talk about edward uh i'm sorry uh james earl jones who's also in the sandlot but he gives one of the great performances of, of his career in field of dreams i think the pacing is wonderful i think the way that it moves through these different scenes and this journey that this guy's going on there are moments that are funny there are moments that are touching it's just great filmmaking it really does call back to frank capra who made movies like it's a wonderful life it has that kind of power to it in the way that the fantasy and the real life combine and Sandlot, it's kind of a fun kids movie, but to me, it does. It, there are some good characters, maybe, but it doesn't resonate really. I, like I said, Stand By Me resonates. Other great films resonate. The, those two movies, they, they don't really speak about baseball. They don't speak to what baseball is, to what it means to people, to what it means to men. No movie does that like Field of Dreams. Okay, that is exactly where you're wrong. Sandlot is a when you, when you talk about baseball movies, Sandlot is probably the most baseball movie out of the three. Sand like baseball is some of the reasons why people become best of friends, and Sandlot is the perfect representation of that because you have this kid named Smalls who knows nothing about baseball. He doesn't even know who Babe Ruth is. He picks up the ball, and we go on this wild journey of this, and that's how he makes friends. And I think that's why it's so you know impactful, especially in the baseball community. As we're talking about what's the best baseball film, Sandlot does that the best because it resonates most within a baseball group or team such as that. There, there are people that actually oh, go drive across the country to go to to the field where Field of Dreams is filmed. It's changed people's lives, and they go there and play okay, baseball fine. with their dads. Sorry. No, you're fine. You're fine. You got it in before time. All right. No. Evan, closing arguments first. Go ahead. Okay, so I, I, I think Jeremy have Jer Jeremy and I have done a very good job at deconstructing Moneyball and what it means. It's, it, look, at the end of the day, it's one of those Oscar films that is going to get overlooked for a while because it's bland. Like, it, it, it does business and things like that very well, but it's not really a baseball movie. We're talking about what's the best baseball movie. And you claim that, yeah, you, and you know, it does baseball well, but then you also said it at the beginning, it's, it's not really a baseball movie. It's a drama, so you're, con you're contradicting yourself there. Um, and, and Jeremy, we have a lot to write down here with Field of Dreams. It's a very personal story that you have, and I'm very happy that you have that. Everybody has a personal story with their parents about a movie. I'm glad it's Field of Dreams, but I just have to tell you, I don't think it's that great of a film. I, I think there's nothing necessarily as special to it. I, I think the pacing is all over the place, and it screams. Field of Dreams screams 90s. You know, the, the type of score that it has and the type of cinematography. And it, it, Field of Dreams is a movie that is stuck in its time. It, I feel like it has aged very poorly um, in comparison to Sandlot because 
no matter what people have those types of connections and relationships with their friends, the, 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 the whole, Hey, Benny, how you doing? The jet? Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, you, you still have those, you know, kind of nicknames with your friends and, and the idea of being able to fit along and the coming of age story that baseball is and the whole idea of this little league team is better than this crappy uh, thing of players. I remember myself going back and going to a very poor, poorly made baseball field, a poorly made baseball field. And look, it, it's something that almost everybody can relate to. And at that time, it was diverse at that time a film like that was diverse and it has the best james earl jones cameo that you will get same lot all right jeremy you're up next go ahead you say that field of dreams uh is stuck in its time that it doesn't resonate like the way that maybe the sandlot does well let me tell you something that just happened in real life uh they the the farmhouse and the field like i said i kind of started to get into where they film field of dreams as a real place and it's open to the public. So people come there to play baseball. And there's I've seen documentaries of fathers and sons going there and playing together. And just recently in the news, there was a fire that took out some of that field. And they took up like a, a crowdsourcing campaign. And people donated over the amount that was even needed to fix that field because people love this movie. It means a lot to a lot of people. And it symbolizes in a very physical way baseball and what baseball is and what it means to people. There are speeches in this movie about baseball, about its history, about how it connects with people. This is, this is a movie for the ages. I don't feel that it's stuck in its time. I feel that it's timeless. I don't think it's any more stuck in its time than It's a Wonderful Life is, which is another timeless, wonderful fantasy uh, story about humanity and about who we are at our best and what we can be it's it's a powerful movie it's a moving movie it's a great fantasy and it it it's got just the great performances of kevin costner of amy madigan as his wife who's so funny their relationship on its own could make a great movie uh it's the the story of james earl jones who was this this author who basically is kind of based on the real author jd salinger he retired he 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 went away from all the public. He didn't want anyone to talk to him anymore. The story, the arc of how he changes, of how he connects to his past, how he loves baseball. There's so much going on in this movie. It's never boring because there's so many great characters. They connect in so many great ways. And when you get to that ending that I talked about before, this is everything that a movie can say about a sport, about how that sport connects to people, how it connects to men, how it connects to families. And it's a great film that resonates on a deeper level. Sandlot is a, is a, kind of a fun kids movie with a lot of hacky jokes in it. Uh, Moneyball is kind of a perfunctory business story. And those movies don't resonate in the way that a movie like Field, Field of Dreams can. And it's such a great film. Go ahead, closing arguments. All right, so I haven't had much time to talk, so here we go. <laughs> so Sandlot is a very fun film that you watch as a kid and you kind of relate to with the character. But I think as a storytelling exploit, it's not a better film than than Moneyball or Field of Dreams just because it's fun and you resonate it with a child it's not as well made as either of our films with uh, Moneyball it has an amazing score which ties the film together great the dialogue in Moneyball is fantastic I think it has the best performances out of any of these films in the year and yeah I said it does baseball well and I don't really like baseball I might have been a little contradictory but I was wanting to say it shows the game of baseball extremely well actually showing the like actual gameplay of it. it shows the community behind it. it shows how people survive how people play the game and it shows brad pitt as an older player and it just shows what people do with that game and how it affects them with field of dreams it obviously has the amazing emotional connection to a lot of people in it, it makes fathers and sons bond with each other more and doesn't make it the best film i think moneyball is extremely well made and it was recognized for its well made it's might be a little you might say it's a little bland but it's a film about sort of making a gamble with baseball which hasn't been done before so you might consider that boring but i consider it a new story that can be told it might have the basic drama thing to it but it's telling a very interesting story that lots of people loved seeing and the performances made it what it is and it made it a fantastically well-made film which is what it was all right Guys, once again, a really, really good fight. Uh, all around, just want to say this was a great game, and everybody did a really good job tonight. Thank you.
Um, mm -hmm. Thank you. So here's where I'm at. Um, unfortunately, even though I do think he came in strong with the closing, I do think in the main portion of the argument, Evan and Jeremy did a good enough job shutting Linus out of this one. So unfortunately, I'm going to have to take Linus out of this question. Um, no, boy. Oh, Jeremy win this. <laughs> <laughs> here's the thing here's, here's the thing though anyway. here's the thing though um i think that both jeremy and evan made a lot of really good uh points towards their movie and i do think a lot of points were made against each other's movies that were really well done but here's the two things that did it in for me a lot of jeremy's points were inspired by obviously something that is real to him, very real to him and goes beyond the movie, but they all didn't necessarily relate to the film itself. And Evan did call that out. Um, and no, I, I can't, I'm not going to say the other, that, that enough alone does validate it for me. There is another thing that stood out, but I can't count it as a part of the official argument because no one ever did call it out. But I, Evan, all of Evan's points were strictly relating to the film itself, whereas a lot of Jeremy's points kind of stood outside of it. Yeah, so with all that in mind, I am going to give the point to Evan on this one, but it was a really, really close round. Um, did well with that. But with that, that means the score is 3-2-3 three to two to three out of the rest of the match. It is Jeremy and Evan that's going to be going on to the speed round here. Great job, Linus. Good job, Linus. Good job to you guys. All right, guys. So with that, it is Evan. It is Jeremy. We are moving into the speed round. For those of you guys who don't know how this works, um, the score is three to three. Um, so each one of you, one of you will have to win three questions in order to secure yourself the victor today. And here's how it's going to work. You guys are going to have 30 seconds on the clock um, for your first initial argument and then 15 for a rebuttal. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you guys the question. The first person to answer goes first. Very simple. Here we go. And uh, may the best man win. First question. I'm going to read you the question and give you two options. You're just going to pick whichever one first. Based, obviously, based on the films, who would you rather have fight alongside you in a fight? The Transformers or the Jaegers? Jaegers. Transformers. All right. Evan said Jaegers first. Jeremy went with Transformers, but Evan did I said say Transformers. First. Jeremy said Jaegers. Yeah, I said Jaegers Look first. The other way around. Wow, okay, I got that backwards. So <laughs> I did. Jeremy, you're going first with Jaegers, not Transformers. Um, it's late, guys. It's real late. Um, uh, 30 seconds on the clock when you begin speaking. The whole storyline of Pacific Rim is that these monsters are destroying the world. They're, they're causing all of this, this havoc and this damage. And people rise up. They create technology. They create these Jaegers to fight the monsters. People work with these robots in these robots to do these amazing things. Transformers, the, all of them come to Earth and destroy Earth. They're causing the destruction. They're the bad guys and in a lot of ways. Even Optimus Prime does a lot of damage by trying to do good things. The Jaegers are purely good. They're purely here to help. We created them. They are the, the robots that I want to be involved with that I want to work with do the great things, not the, dis the just mass destruction of Transformers. All right, All right. All right the last little bit. Seconds on the clock when you begin speaking. Transform Transformers are the ones that we want to work with for a few reasons. One, because they, are a, they, they do many things. They fly, they drive, they play good music, as in Bumblebee, and they're great to hang out with. And, and you said, yeah, some of them are evil, but that's the whole point. We're fighting evil. The good Transformers fight the evil. We have the Megacons, and that's what they're going to do. And the Acres, they're just boring. They move up and down, and, and, they, and, and they're on human uh, dependability. And we've seen time and time again, humans are not dependable. And AI, as we know, will take over the Earth. And part of the Jaeger is its AI and its human dependability, which is not dependable at all. Fine. Um. 15 seconds on the clock for Jeremy when you begin speaking. We're talking about what you would want in this situation, not what might be more fun to watch as a movie. You're talking about the Transformers are fun. They play music. They do fun things. I'm talking about the real situation. The real situation is if I see a bunch of alien robots come to Earth and start destroying the Earth, I don't care who's on the supposedly the good Hi. side or who's on the bad side. They're just robots. Hi. I want 
the Jaegers. Evan, you'll get an extra second or two there. Go ahead. Talking about real situation, the thing is the Jaegers aren't really that comparable because we can't build Jaegers. There is a good chance that cars could transform into real robots, and the transformers <laughs> are, there's a more realistic chance of transformers, and they're more dependable <laughs> than they on their own. Humans are not dependable with the Jaegers, and I'm scared of that. We cannot have Jaegers be turning on us, and there's a bigger chance of the Jaegers turning on us than Transformers. All right. All right. Good arguments from both of you. Um, the point that won it for me that wasn't addressed in the rebuttal. Um was Evan's point in the first argument that the Jaegers rely on human dependability in order to work, whereas Transformers are more automated. Uh, Jeremy addressed other parts of the argument, but he did not address that part, and so that means Evan takes the first point of the speed round. He goes up four to three. Hey. All right. Second question, and this one may take a second, so... If you guys need me to double check something uh, number wise, I can. What is the best movie to fail at the box office? Citizen Kane. Okay. And that that, that qualifies, Jeremy. It, it failed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it almost did, it, it almost didn't get released. <laughs> Shawshank Redemption, how about that? Shawshank Redemption for Citizen Kane Part 2. Part two. I that, def I, that, I de that definitely works, Aaron. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, like, just looking at base numbers, but doing the math in my head, yeah, mm -hmm. that qualifies. Yeah, that movie was, like, forgotten the year it came out. Yeah. That qualifies. Okay, so uh, I guess we're doing uh, round two of this. We are. Um... It's going to be Citizen Kane for Jeremy and Shawshank Redemption from Evan. Um, so, Jeremy, you are first. 30 seconds on the clock when you begin speaking. Citizen Kane is a movie that barely got released because William Randolph Hearst wanted to destroy the movie because it was supposedly about his life. And when it did come out, people weren't allowed to actually talk about it. It, it, it got some nominations, but it faded very quickly. And then years later, it was brought back by people that love movies and recognize as the greatest film of all time. It, it, any movie can bomb, but if it's great, it's always going to come back. Shawshank found a life and spoke to people on home, home video, but not in the way that Citizen Kane has changed the way we think about movies, the way that it has touched filmgoers over the years. This is the movie that bombed that was almost destroyed that barely, almost didn't even exist Time. and it changed cinema i like having my own old timer all right here we go 30 seconds on the clock Here's the thing about Shawshank Redemption. It's probably the better told story. It's the story that has the tightest script. It's the story that has the better, you know, has the better performances. And you keep talking about the influence that Citizen Kane had on the uh, uh, on the, the cinema, but it also came out during a time of of um, of uh, Wizard of Oz and Casablanca. And those, I would argue, those films overshadow Citizen Kane. Like people don't even realize the whole sled thing uh, with Citizen Kane. Yeah, this guy tried to destroy it and it came back, but that's just the way how cinema works. People like to preserve things. Like, come on now, uh, Shawshank Redemption is a much much better film. And time. All right, 15 seconds on the clock for Jeremy when you begin speaking. Shawshank Redemption is not a better told story. It's got some weak performances and some of the supporting roles. Tim Robbins is one note. Uh, Horace and Wells gives one of the greatest performances of all time. It's nuanced. There's so much dimension to it. And this movie means more to film people than Casablanca. This is the number one ranked movie by all the great film uh, historians. This is right. the movie that's right. researching classes. All right, Evan, I'll give you two extra seconds on that. Time starts when you begin speaking. What's an overshadowed then? Why am I talking about today? What do people remember? Do people remember Citizen Kane or do people remember Rossi? The Wizard of the Wonderful Wizard of Oz. But they also I obviously remember Wizard of Oz. And also, did, you know, Orson Welles' best performance. Dude, this launched Morgan Freeman's career. A guy who is memed and the guy who is super iconic with his voice. It launched his career and it's very well told and it's very depressing and it's the way how it's going. Okay. Arguments on both sides. That was, a, that was actually really, really good. Um, I love living from the north because I can talk really fast. Or with my parents being from the north because it helps me talk really fast. 
Okay. Um. <laughs> Um, that was really, really close. Okay. I think the point that's going to do it for me, just because I don't know if the reiteration against it was exactly what I needed, was the fact that Evan said it might be a little more overshadowed by films that have also influenced filmmaking from that time. He did give specific examples of films from the time that made more in the popular culture nowadays than Citizen Kane. I don't think it was quite hit back against in a way that defeated the point. So I'm going to give it. I'm going to give it to Evan on that one as well. <sighs> Shit, that was close though. Jeremy, I did count. Gonna... I did. I did counter it. No matter what happens, we're going to need an instant rematch. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Jesus Christ. Okay. All right. <sighs> okay. You're stressed. Uh, third, third, third. Yeah, this is kind of stressful. Uh, third speed round question. All right, so here's where it's at. Jeremy, as of now, you have to sweep the board in order to win the match. Evan, next point you get gets you the win. All right, 2017. It's a year which everybody's complaining about. There's nothing original in Hollywood. So what was the most disappointing sequel of 2017? Ooh. It has to be a sequel, right? Come on. It. What's your idea that you're going with? Oh, fuck. Okay. Uh, do you have yours, Jeremy? No. Ah, <laughs> oh, that's such a good question. Oh, yeah, those are two. So many. Choose from. I, can tell even, I can tell even Linus is thinking about this. I'll mute myself. No, you're good. Is Jamie doing right. what I think he's doing? All right, so at, at this point, if one of you does come up with something, say it, because if it qualifies and it counts, the other one has to come up with something quicker. Can't it's the golden circle. That counts. Transformers The Last Night. That is also a sequel. We're going to be going first 30 seconds on the clock for Kingsman versus Transformers. Kingsman the, Kingsman the Golden Circle was coming off of a film that was actually good. And the facts that I actually had to enter a rape joke in, in this Me Too movement where, where someone was had something being put in them that, that they didn't know about. And it was it lacked of substance. It was full style. It was, it was a classic Zack Snyder film that was directed by Matthew Vaughn. It shocks many of us. And it should have been a much better. It should have been a much classier. It should have been much better performances. It got rid of characters um, that we didn't care about. And it was just dumb, silly. And it should have been much, much more just like the first Kingsman. Okay, and time. Jeremy, 30 seconds on the clock when you begin speaking. All right, the original Transformers is a good movie. It was a fun uh, bringing these characters to the big screen, and then the bad sequel started, and with each sequel we've all wanted, maybe this is going to be the good one. Maybe this is going to bring it back. The last night had a cool idea. It had good trailers. It had uh, a pretty good cast. We were hoping, we were hoping it would finally happen. It was the worst one. It doesn't make any sense. It's hard to watch. It's painful. It's awful. And the, good, the Kingsman sequel is a good movie. It's got good actors in it. Uh, it's, it's, you know, maybe not as good as the original, but it's fun to watch. It's got some great action scenes. It's got a great Great director Matthew Vaughn. Michael Bay does not care about Transformers. Right. He's phoning in and it's painful. All right, Evan, I'll give you a couple extra seconds there. Time starts 15 seconds for the rebuttal when you begin speaking. 
Okay, you said the OG was only fun. It wasn't a great movie. Uh, you said it had great. I uh, said good actors. Okay, Mark uh, Mark Wahlberg is a good actor. Um, it, like and, and also it has a rape joke in it. The Me Too movement in this time. Come on now, it has much classier. And that and the characters meant nothing. The performances were terrible. Kings from the Gold Circle should have been much much more. Time. All right. Fifteen seconds on the clock for you, Jeremy. When you begin speaking. I think Taron Egerton is 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 charming. I, I enjoyed him in the movie. Colin Firth is always great. Look, it, it's it's a it's a sequel that that is exciting, entertaining. It works on a lot of levels. Whereas Transformers is just the bilge. It's awful. It could have been it could have been something good. It could have been something new, and it was just the same horrible right. dreck. Thank you, said same. Okay. Just based on the picks alone, I'd be inclined to agree with Evan. But here's the thing. In your second half of the argument, you reiterated every point of your first argument. There wasn't a lot, a whole lot new added to it. I think Jeremy on that point did a good enough job of explaining why Kingsman 2 is at least serviceable enough that I'm gonna give him the point. I think it was I think it was a close one. It's just a lot of people could perceive what Jeremy picked as an easy argument against him. I don't think you quite hit that. I think Jeremy did a better job of explaining why Kingsman 2 was at least a serv serviceable enough sequel over the last night. All right. So Jeremy does get a point. The score is five to four in Evan's favor. All right. Moving on to the next question. Um, actually, question for you guys. Uh, did you like The Last Jedi? Just general opinion? Yes. Yeah, it was, it was fine. Okay, cool. Love it. What is the worst scene in Star Wars The Last Jedi? And I'm talking about one specific scene, so I'm not accepting the entirety of Canto Bite as an answer. That's tough. All right, the scene where uh, Rose kisses uh, Finn, uh, um, Finn uh, during the laser uh, shooting battle at the end. Thank Got you. It. Got uh, it. I know, I know, I know where you're going for. Uh, BB-8 shoots down the whole thing, and um, and Finn kills Thasma. That that scene. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. I know where you both are talking about. Jeremy, you answered first, so thirty seconds on the clock. Everyone can agree the Canto Bite sequence totally uh, brings the movie down a peg. It, it distracts from the storyline. It takes us away from the things that we care about with Luke and Ray. And this is the ultimate moment where these two characters we really don't care about that have been doing this stuff uh, have this supposed love scene that comes out of nowhere. It doesn't connect. And it takes out of the dramatic end of the movie with Luke, with what he does. It takes us out. It brings the movie down when it could have been firing on all cylinders. It could have been the greatest ending of any Star Wars movie. And they sneak this right in the middle of it. The BB-8 scene is fun. I enjoyed it, and there were a lot of cheering in the theater. Okay. Couple extra seconds on there, Evan. 30 seconds on the clock when you begin speaking. Something that people always uh, tear down about Star Wars Rebels is how bad um, how bad the droid is there. But here's the thing. BB-8 does the exact same thing, and he's destroying things for no reason. Droids aren't supposed to do that. Droids aren't supposed to be the guy, the reason that things that. And the killing of Thasma, this this character has no reason to die, and we have seen time time before she's this complete badass, and she's just she just completely dies. Like it makes zero sense. She had no character development, and Finn killing her makes no sense because it, uh, she is much more trained than she is. And also, that kiss is very important because you, as we saw, Finn doesn't love her, but she loves him, and, and that's a very complex dynamic there. Time. All right, fifteen seconds on the clock for you, Jeremy, when you begin speaking. BB-8 is one of the great heroes of the entire uh, two films. He, he is just this funny droid, but he does so many amazing things. He is he, he's like R2-D2 on another level, and this is a moment in which he comes to the rescue, and it was fun. It was it was unexpected. I cheered. A lot of people cheered, and I don't Fine. care what, what Rose thinks because she's not developed. Fine. Go ahead when you're ready. 
the part you think about you're forgetting about that scene is, is all the ships flying at that fleet there and that was such an amazing moment the cinematography the the, the white salt there and also though i think you're completely skimming over the facts that thin kill plasma which makes zero sense and we bba is nowhere near r2 are you kidding me All right. Um. God damn it. Oh, God. Okay. Okay, 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 okay. It was really, really close. And I'm just trying to play the fight back out in my head. So, I mean, both both of you kind of discussed the definite negatives of the scene. With Jeremy, it's more about how it kind of pulls you out of the movie a little bit when it happens. Uh, Evan talking about how the droid shouldn't really be the hero, shouldn't be the hero, um, and how it plot-wise it doesn't necessarily make sense that Finn should kill Phasma, um, at least in that moment. Um, I'm going to go with my gut instinct on that one, and my gut instinct says Evan won that one. I'm going to give the point to Evan. Um, which does mean that the score goes up 6-4. to four. Evan has won the match, which means, Evan DeGraff, you are the first champion of Movie Battleground. Oh, my God. Thank you, Linus. Holy shit. I never want to do this again. You scared me so much. Ultimate congratulations to everybody involved. That was a title fight. Everybody had their strong moments. Everybody had a weak moment here or there. But I think you guys definitely proved that you deserve to be here in this match today. Um, I'm going to go to Linus first on this one. Uh, Linus, you come out of here with two points in today's match in the main game. How are you feeling after that? I'm pretty impressed with my two points. I went into this match. I wasn't too confident. These are both fantastic competitors. Congrats to Evan. But there was a point in the match where I was down. They both had two points, and I was at zero. And it was that fourth film franchise question, and I knew I had to bring my A game for it, and I did. And some of these questions, I don't know if I, I wasn't completely focused on it or something. I, They won great. They did amazing jobs but i think if i focus a bit more on questions i can be stronger in the future and it was just such an honor to be in this title fight i'm happy that i was able to do as well as i did between these two amazing competitors and this was fun to watch and shout out to luca too who probably would have done great if he was here but this was an amazing match to watch congrats to both you guys all right Thanks, and then just one quick thing um in terms of your future and where things kind of stand. Um, no matter how your participation in the tournament goes, you are guaranteed one of the five seats in the five-way match for a contention spot uh, in the next title contention match, which will be against the runner-up of the tournament and Luca Fallon. That's where we're going to sit him back in there. Um, but looking at your tournament, the first match you're going to have is going to be against the winner of Chris Clark versus myself. Just preferably, uh, what do you think your chances are in that match, and who do you think you'd like to see? Um, keep in mind, I did just eliminate you from this match, so no personal feelings, right? No, no personal feelings at all. You've been good to me in other matches before, and this, I think, playing you would be very fun. You're a strong competitor, and both of you guys would be strong competitors to face in this tournament and I'm going to come to this tournament strong I'm going to make sure I prepare as much as I need to focus on bringing my A game and I'd be excited to see either one of you in the ring none of you are going to be a slouch none of you are like you. your seating does not describe the amount 
of greatness you are in this league. And I will try to fight my way back. And hopefully, which is going to be very exciting, competing with that many people it might be pretty chaotic. But I'll be excited to try and get a shot again. Definitely. All right. And we'll move on for Jeremy again. Once again, man, performance in today's match. Um, like Linus as well, you are guaranteed a seat in that five-way match come the end of the tournament to try and get another shot at this title. Um, but looking at your future in the tournament, your first match is going to be going up against the winner of either Mark Boric or Drake Fremsdorf. So, and based on anything you know about those competitors, who would you like to see in your first match in the tournament? Um, I would like to fight Mark just because he's my friend and we, we fight a lot and, and have a lot of disagreements on different opinions. So it'd be kind of fun to do that in an official arena. Uh, and any thoughts on today's match? I'm sorry. I can't hear you. All right. Any thoughts on today's match? Look, all I can say is that I fought my heart out. I've done that all season. You know, every match that I've fought, I've had great competitors to fight against, and it's gone down to the last, to the last questions. Um, and, you know, I feel like, you know, if you fight your heart out and you give it your best and you love movies and you express that, then you're not really a loser. So um, that's just kind of how I feel about it. I mean, I'm a little exhausted right now <laughs> after fighting for five hours and then losing it at the end there. It's, it, I'm not going to say it's not a little demoralizing, but I know in my heart I gave it my best fight, and Evan is a great competitor. Um, and, you know, he came in at the last minute. He did an amazing job. And though I'm honestly going to say I don't necessarily agree with the decision, I'm not going to take anything away with F from Evan. Evan uh, is a great competitor, and uh, I don't think it's – you know, an insult to have, say he's the first champion based on uh, everything that he's done this season. That's fair enough. I feel like to be happy with any of the decisions made tonight because the problem is it's it's all opinion based. It's how it hits you in the moment. Um, but I don't think the thing that anyone can deny is that everyone here is a great fighter. And with that, we go to the first champ, Evan. How you doing, man? I'm shocked. Very, very shocked. I I, I thought I thought I had this one. Um. There, there was one where I thought I deserved to lose, and there was one that I thought I deserved to win. So that kind of flipped on its head, which was funny in my opinion. But um, like it, it, at the end of the day, it's very opinion based. Um, you can break down an argument as many ways as you want to, but it's also very objective. I do want to see Jeremy again, not to take anything away from Linus, but Jeremy will be giving some of the best fights in the tournament. I think he's going to run the table. I think Linus, he, he's a second round competitor. I'm just speaking objectively, um, but it's okay. I, he has a chance to run it too, and, and that's the scary part. Like, I, I'm in, I'm in a position where I have to defend this freaking thing. This um, <laughs> I am. That's okay, babe. <laughs> I, I am proud of myself because, you know, I, I was able to completely, you know, I had to forfeit three questions due to time constraints, and I had to do X, Y, and Z. But that's past the point. I fought against fantastic competitors, and I was able to pull it out, and I'm honored. And yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, there, yeah, this match is going to have controversy. There's no way that everyone's going to be happy with this, but, um, my, you know, my girlfriend is screaming. She's angrier than I am. <laughs> maybe that's the start of the yelling and the controversy. Who knows? <laughs> oh, it's, it, it may be the start, but it's certainly not the end. I look forward to this. Yeah. Um, you're, you're all punks, according to her. Her words, not mine. <laughs> I think you guys are okay. good. <laughs> no, um, Jesus Christ. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, this is definitely um, going to go over very interestingly, and I'm very, very excited to see how this goes. Um, with that being said, this is the end of the match. Everyone go ahead and plug yourselves. Linus, where can people find you? You can find me at on Twitter at either the Linus Babcock or at Shimodown Linus. I have two Twitters. And you can find me around the Movie Battleground page. Hopefully the season is starting back in. I can maybe get back to hosting some matches, yeah, like and I'll be in the tournament, and that'll be exciting. And one more thing, if hopefully I'd like to see Isaac Horvath sometime in the tournament. We had our one match, and I'd like to see him again because it was pretty close. Definitely. And uh, Jeremy, where can the people find you? 
I'm one of the uh, admins at Full Metal Trivia, Full Metal Media, which is a, a sister uh, trivia league that's connected here on the Worldwide Movie Games Network. Um, and we do really fun matches there, so please check those out. I also am the head question writer at There Will Be Trivia, which is kind of the flagship trivia uh, group on this on this network. And uh, you can find me on Facebook and Twitter under Jeremy Paul Adams and under YouTube under Jeremy Paul Adams. And I have some fun uh, movie playlists there if you want to watch a lot of great movie scenes that I've compiled. And I, I make Make these uh, kind of fun cartoon videos too. So please check it out. Definitely, definitely. Evan, where can people find you? You guys can find me at Evan DeGraff15 on the Twitters, and you guys can uh, follow my YouTube channel, Evan DeGraff. I am relaunching that sucker, and it's going to be insane. So keep your eyes out for that. All right. And uh, I don't have a Twitter, but you guys can follow me on Instagram at Aaron T. Canole. Um, you guys can obviously find me as one of the admins, hosts, question writer, and everything else in between here at Movie Battleground. You guys can also obviously now find us at Worldwide Movie Games, where this video is going to be uploaded. All the stuff that posts on our page is going to be on the at Facebook page as well. So if you guys aren't a part of either of those groups, follow them. Um, and that'll be it. Like I said, obviously we have the tournament coming up, so we're not going to be able to get in any new players for a certain amount of time. But if you guys are interested in possibly playing a match down the road and you're not a part of the Facebook page, the only way to be getting a match, you guys got to join that Facebook page. If you guys aren't a part of the other Facebook pages involved as well, including uh, Worldwide Movie Games, Full Metal Trivia, uh, There Will Be Trivia, all the different uh, Facebook pages associated with this uh, group collective that we have here, definitely join those and become a part of those. It's the only way, you know, support one, support all. It's the best thing for you guys to do. And, you know, every single day on this channel, we're going to have something out for you guys to give you guys as much entertainment as possible. And uh, with that, follow and support all the admins, Linus Babcock, Subhash Sharma, uh, Matt Beer, Andrew Hayes, Robert Parker, and of course the new champ, Evan DeGraff. Uh, begin the hashtag admin bias. Now, my name is Aaron Canole, and I'll see you guys next time on the Movie Battleground. Take care, everyone.